<clears throat> All right. So welcome. We are uh, at the beginning of our regular school board meeting here in Cape Elizabeth. It's Tuesday, March 9th, 2021, 6.30 p.m. And it is um, via Zoom. Um, just a reminder, as we do at the beginning of every uh, meeting, there is a strategic plan goals of health and well being, global competency, multiple pathways and definitions of success, safe and sustainable, effective facilities, and environmental responsibility. For um, independence, um, I'm going to do a roll call. Heather Altenberg, Yay. Kimberly Carr. Yay. Till Frostier. Yay. Elizabeth Seyfried. Yay. Cynthia Volt. Yay. Uh, Jennifer McVeigh. Yay. Laura Danino. Yay. And our student rep, Joey Labry. Yay. And Ellie Gagney. Yay. Excellent. Um, so could we please stand for the pre Pledge of Allegiance? Jen will put the flag on for us and share her screen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So um, before we begin anything tonight, I just want to give a huge shout out to our very own Jill Young, our um, middle school uh, nurse who was just on Channel 6 News. Um, and I'm just grateful for all that she does. I'm grateful for representing Cape Elizabeth. Um, and I believe Donna, our superintendent, um, Dr. Wolfram, is going to speak a little bit more. So um, Jill did a 45 minute, inter minute interview today um, with the um, Channel 6 reporter. And for those of you who watched, she was only on for about a minute or so, maybe 45 seconds. Um, um, but um, she did during her interview, give huge shout outs to the staff, um, the teamwork, the community, and, and really the, the entire year in, in, um, in review uh, for, for really the keeping our students and our staff uh, safe because it was truly a, um, a team effort. So she wished, she did talk in the interview a lot about uh, mental health and community kindness messages. Um, However, that didn't get, unfortunately, didn't get included in the airing. But um, anyway, thank you, Jill, for your great representation of our district and the work that everybody on the team has done. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that, Donna. And um, absolutely, uh, Jill was highlighting that um, we have three fabulous nurses, uh, Karen Jenkins in the high school and Aaron Taylor in Pond Cove that have all worked tirelessly for a year. So I just want to start um, by speaking to the public for a moment, uh, my fellow board members, administrators, um, that I know there is a lot of uh, concern. I know there's a lot of energy. I know there's a lot of fear and worry and anxiety right now, the pandemic has lasted a long time and it's very difficult. And I think it is difficult for everybody in their own unique ways. I want to reiterate that I think we all want the same thing. I think we all want what's best for our students. And I think we all want to get our students back to school, full-time learning as quickly as we possibly can and safely. I think that is a common goal. As a result, we, um, to help include the community more, the board, along with the support from Superintendent Wolfram, has begun implementing three communication strategies 
one, uh, I believe there's been two so far, uh, our superintendent has given us an update with bullet points, so it's not overwhelming, but quick and to the point, um, talking about where we are, the state that we're in, um, as far as green, yellow, red, um, and some of the action steps and investigations and behind the scenes work that's being done um, by the administrators. So that's been coming out on Fridays. Um, you may have noticed that on our agenda tonight, we've added a COVID update, which our superintendent will speak to us again during that time and help inform us a little bit more. And we have created an FAQ of frequently asked questions based on emails we've received and what we um, perceive to be uh, questions that the public has. Um, I'd like to say that that is a living document. We've already added to it at least once. Um, so uh, we're trying to keep that up to date and, um, and allow you all to be for informed. There is um, also a committee to discuss reopening plans that is in the process of being formed. My hope was that before tonight, it would have been solidified. I could have gotten an email out explaining who um, was going to be on that committee, but it, it um, all the contacts haven't been made and we weren't quite there yet. But I just want to communicate to everybody that that is in the works um, to help uh, work with administration to, um, to um, work to see if there's hopefully a solution and ways to get students back safely. Um, I also want to uh, explain to everybody um, that it is an agenda item um, that the board will be discussing about advocacy. And in tonight, um, we're going to be discussing, we had initially planned on um, the advocacy being uh, a request for teachers to get vaccinated. Um, it looks like that's happening. So the discussion the board will be having later that I will be bringing up is that maybe we can shift that advocacy to another focus. Um, thanking the governor for that work um, and what can be done next, what are our next steps and what could potentially be loosened in order to, to, um, in order to move forward. So that all being said, um, I do notice, um, and this is a recommendation from co-board member uh, Cindy Bolt, um, that the public is not aware of how many attendees are here. So I just wanna share, there are currently 141 attendees. Um, we will be having um, public comment uh, in a moment, um, but I just wanted to start off the meeting giving you a little bit of heads up about what um, we are doing in the background um, to remind each other that um, that we all are sharing a common goal and um, we are all trying to do what's best for our students. So that being said, moving on to agenda, uh, excuse me, item one, are there any adjustments to the agenda? Looking at board members right now. And I am seeing none. So moving on, may I have a motion for item two, please? I move we approve the minutes from the February 9th, 2021 regular business meeting. Thank you, Laura. May I have a second? I second that. Kimberly. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions or comments? Any discussion? Okay, seeing none, we need to vote. Heather Altenberg is yay. Kimberly Carr. Yay. Phil Saucier. Yay. Elizabeth Seifried. Yay. Cynthia Volk, Cindy Volk. Yay. Jen McVay. Yay. And Laura Danino. Yay. Okay, thank you. Um, next item on the agenda is uh, comments from the public. Um, just as a reminder, I say this every time, the um, comments are three minutes long. We have a time slot in our agenda for 20 minutes. If it looks like there are more comments after that, um, the board then discusses if we would like to move forward. Um, it is not my choice as a chair, it is a collective decision as a board 
to give more time for public comment. Um, just a few reminders about public commenting. Um, one is that please refrain from commenting about individuals as it is against our policy. Um, and please uh, try to refrain, um, how do I say this? Because there are now 148 people here and there are potentially many people who would like to speak, um, if it's possible, if the same message is being repeated, um, if you could be respectful of time and avoid the repetition of messages. Um, we do have a full agenda ahead of us and um, the work in a, in a business meeting is to be voting and going through um, some of our policies. Um, this is not a public forum, but we do offer comments on the agenda and seeing that there is now a standing COVID item, um, there may be quite a few comments about COVID. So um, I will do my best. If you would like to speak, you raise your hand um, and I will call on you. You can then unmute yourself. And um, Elizabeth, I believe is gonna be the timekeeper for me. So she will uh, respond. Um, okay, so I see Ryan M. So yes, uh, so our, this is my husband's uh, account. So this is Sarah Dodwell. I live at 54 Oakhurst Road. So I'm a mom to a second and fifth grader. And I wanna be clear that I'm, I'm speaking for myself. Um, however, I'm one of the now 50 medical professional parents who sent the board a letter on February 22nd. In that letter, we asked for accelerated movement towards full-time in-person schooling, meaningful and open communication on those plans and enthusiastically offered our expertise to help solve this problem. It was signed by numerous pediatricians and pediatric subspecialists, psychiatrists, nurses, and critical care providers, among others. As I know has been the case for other parents who have reached out to the board, the initial response was silence. And then, thank you for your concern, uh, followed by please see the frequently asked questions and please see the main Department of Education guidelines. Specifically regarding our request to have medical representatives on a newly forming committee that you mentioned, we were told our needs are not medical right now. Not medical. As we're faced with the enormous and wholly unique challenge of trying to educate our children in the midst of a public health crisis. We have amazing administrators, teachers and staff who are working harder than ever to piece together an education for our children and I don't for a second question their abilities. But if there was ever a time to employ the full human resources of this town, it is now. The medical professional parents are just the tip of the iceberg. We have engineers and architects and childcare providers and business owners who are ready to lend their expertise and perspectives. We can join together with teachers and administrators and school boards to find a way. Other school boards are including parents and medical professionals into these discussions in meaningful ways. As an example, Yarmouth has four parents in addition to four outside medical advisors on their task force. Your proposed committee would have only two parents, not even one from each school, and just one of whom is allowed to have a medical background. This is token inclusion and ensures that parent voices or any outsider voices will be minimized. I don't understand the resistance from our leadership to accept help, to let us into the conversation, to have meaningful exchanges. There are so many questions that need addressing, not just the matter of when to bring kids back, but how. And once they're back full time, how do we deal with the consequences of this year that has affected children in so many different ways? We are pleading with you for the sake of our kids, for our teachers, for the sake of our community, to include us in this conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, next, and I apologize if I say your last name wrong, it's Petra. Is that enough? Hi. How do you yeah, pronounce I'm... your last name? Gulliametti. I know there's okay. a lot of consonants in there. <laughs> okay, thank you. 
Yeah, so my name is Petra Guglielmeni. I live at 45 Stonegate Road, and I wanted to address the agenda item about COVID response. Um, my family relocated to Cape from New Jersey in the fall. We have two children at Pond Cove and one at the middle school. I grew up in Cape. My parents live here, and I finally convinced my husband that we should raise our kids here. Despite arriving mid-pandemic, we've experienced firsthand why Cape schools have the reputation they do. With dedicated principals, teachers, and guidance counselors working creatively to make a difficult year meaningful and productive. We've also been lucky to connect with fellow newcomers from cities like Boston, New York, London, and Houston, all of whom intentionally chose CAPE for its schools. Yet one by one, those friends are putting down deposits on private school for fall. One who rents is reconsidering whether to buy a house here. These families bring with them enormous passion for education, not to mention resources they'd be investing in our schools over the next decade. Instead, they may join the many Cape families who's, who've already transferred their kids out. How many of those kids will never come back? The answer to that question depends on decisions you are making now. This is a pivotal moment for public education and for Cape. Parents understand the challenges, but we need to understand the benchmarks. If low rates of COVID and vaccinating teachers won't be enough to get our kids back, what will and by when? Your answers will guide difficult choices. Many of us are willing to stretch ourselves thin to find alternatives because our kids can't afford and do not deserve another six months of falling behind. With every week that passes, learning gaps grow wider and harder for teachers to close once things return to normal. As you know, schools are finding new ways to open five days while following CDC guidelines. Had we stayed in New Jersey, my kids would now be getting double the live instruction, despite much older facilities and more crowded classrooms, not to mention the collective trauma that remains from when the first wave hit the New York City area. Overcoming understandable fear, they are following the evidence that schools are among the safest places to be. Our challenges in CAPE are comparatively smaller, plus we have ample relevant data to reassure us and ideas to inspire us from the dozens of main schools, public and private, that have been open full-time since fall. I'm sure as parents, you agree that hybrid learning is not an appropriate long-term substitute for classroom time, especially for our youngest children. One year has already passed. I see a spacious library sitting closed on school property while my kindergartner learns via iPad, but I'm holding out hope. We can still use the next three months to impact our little one's earliest impressions of school. Parents need to see progress and the plan for getting all kids back, even if DOE distancing requirements don't change. For now, I'm choosing to remain optimistic that CAPE will rise to meet this challenge. Kids need their teachers, they need each other, and they need you to fight for them. Thank you for your time and your service to our community. Thank you. Um, next is Anastasia Norman. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Can you hear me? Yes. Wonderful. Um, my name's Annie Norman, and I live at Six Dahl Road in Cape Elizabeth. I have two children at Pond Cove, one in kindergarten and one in second grade. I am also a local physician in the community. And uh, first of all, I would like to say that I am in deep awe and in gratitude for all that the Cape Elizabeth and Pond Cove, especially students, uh, teachers, and faculty have been able to, to pull together this year having uh, invented out of thin air, really, in the late summer and early fall of 2020, an entire system of education, trained it and implemented it within a period of weeks. Uh, this is amazing. And I'm in great gratitude for this. Um, I know that a lot of people are going to be talking about um, going back to full time. And I will say that I am also a fan um, my specific situation that I wanted to share is that not every family is in the same boat when it comes to achievement gaps. And even though our family comes from a great amount of privilege, we have struggled with some pretty significant gaps in reading and writing, which I wanted to share because they may help inform decisions. As we were starting the pandemic last March, we became aware that my second grader was not yet able to read and this was the end of first grade. He was not able to read independently books even as simple as Cat in the Hat. And at the time, we were not sure if this was because of um, him being on basically a different trajectory or if there was a learning disability. The case was that when we entered pandemic, we had two children, a kindergartner and now a first grader, neither of whom 
could be independent with independent learning at home, which meant that as a physician in the middle of a pandemic, both my husband and myself, we needed to come off work to be able to support our children so that they would be able to receive any amount of instruction. And it has been a very rough road. We are fortunate that our family has the resources to be able to afford private instruction as well as sending our children to school for the days that they are able to. And with that, I was able to return to my clinical duties late summer and early fall of 2020. However, neither of our children are anywhere near grade level. And my situation is such that this makes it difficult for either of them to be able to be independent with their learning. And I only think about the families who don't have thousands of dollars to spend on tutoring and additional resources such as we have had to do even to bring our kids up so that they're only one grade level behind, much less two. Not every family is equally affected by the pandemic. And I worry that the gap between certain children who are able to keep up because of their family resources or their own individual characteristics and the families that through no, no fault of their own um, are not able to keep up, that that gap is going to create incredibly difficult challenges for teachers next fall as they try to manage a classroom where some- Ms. Norman, I'm sorry to interject, but it's been about three minutes and 30 seconds. That is all that I wanted to share. Thank you. Okay. Um, next up, I believe, is Zakia Nelson. Uh, Zakia, you should um, be able to unmute yourself, I believe, now. It looks like you're still on mute. There you go. Thank you. So um, I am Zakia Nelson. I live in Broad Cove, and I'm an epidemiologist with the Federal Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Thank you so much. I'm also a CAPE resident with three children currently in the schools. And throughout this school year, despite surges in SARS-CoV-2 rates in our community, CAPE Elizabeth schools have remained open for in-person learning. This is due both to the efficacy of the public health mitigation strategies and the incredible effort of the staff, nurses, and teachers who consistently implemented them. We all saw uh, case rates in Cumberland County rise through November and December and peak in January. While they decreased after that peak, they have plateaued at a high level. When community rates of SARS-CoV-2 are high, it is more likely someone infected will come into and potentially spread it in the school environment. However, spread within schools can be limited with strict use of mitigation strategies. And you're probably already familiar with these, but CDC's school guidance emphasizes five mitigation strategies to reduce school spread of SARS-CoV-2, masks, physical distancing of six feet or more, hand washing and respiratory etiquette, cleaning and ventilation, and contact tracing in combination with isolation and quarantine. Layering these strategies or using more than one at a time provides greater protection than using a single strategy alone. We know this because studies have shown that in schools where multiple strategies were used, particularly masks and distancing, the school setting was not associated with transmission. When there have been breaches in these protocols or they were not implemented together, outbreaks have occurred in schools. We also know that in university environments where mitigation strategies were difficult to consistently employ and the population was less compliant, outbreaks were widespread and well-documented. The CDC has recently provided guidance for phased opening, reopening of schools to a full five-day schedule that considers risk of transmission in the community. Right now, our county's case rate is considered high by the CDC at over 100 total cases per 100,000 population in the past seven days. That rate needs to fall below 50 total cases per population in the past seven days to be considered low to moderate. This is why public health is a victim of its own success. Since all of these strategies have been working and we haven't seen outbreaks in our school environment, it's tempting to think they aren't necessary. However, returning to a hybrid model, returning from a hybrid model to full in-person instruction would remove one of the most simple effective tools we have against SARS-CoV-2 transmission, physical distancing. At a time when community case rates remain high and more infectious variants are increasingly a larger part of our daily confirmed cases, 
This decision would increase the risk of an outbreak in the school and the community. There is a light at the end of the tunnel. As more of our community becomes vaccinated, we expect to see cases decrease. And with lower transmission in the community, there will be lower risk of transmission in schools and schooling can resume normally while we peel back layers of these mitigation strategies as they no longer become necessary or as they become no longer necessary. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Stacy Hughes, if you wanna unmute yourself, you have three minutes. Great, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, thank you, yep. Stacy. My name is Stacy Hughes. I live at 8 Hannaford Cove Road. I first and foremost want to thank our teachers. This past year has undoubtedly been the most difficult year of their careers. Working within an impossible teaching model, they have persisted. And I'm so thrilled vaccines are now rolling out for them. I'm speaking tonight on behalf of our community, a community that is so broken, a community that somewhere along the road has forgotten how to communicate has forgotten how to collaborate. We are all hurting and we are desperately seeking a change. Professionally, I work as an occupational therapist. I have specialty in sensory integration and working with children. I mention this solely because occupational therapists specialize in working with people of all ages to find balance in work, rest and play or leisure pursuits. We look at people and treat them holistically, physically, mentally, and from a social emotional standpoint. Children, as we know, learn best through play. They develop through play and social interactions, and they learn from their peers through sharing, collaboration, and exchanging ideas. Picture for a moment the kindergartners playing with blocks in separate bins, unable to touch each other's blocks, unable to work together, think together, play together. One day, someone overheard the students whispering as they sat there, one student with one side of a bridge and another student with the other side. They were whispering as they looked at each other from a distance, maybe we could share. They were whispering like it was a bad word, but there they sat instinctively knowing if they only worked together, they could literally build bridges. What are we teaching our children, the future of our community, if we are not allowing them to share and collaborate with block play? What are we teaching our children if we as a community do not begin to collaborate work together to begin putting solutions in place. When my eighth grader receives texts or Snapchats from his peers at one, two, and three o'clock in the morning, what are these kids thinking about? Are they reaching out for help? Are they feeling alone, isolated, worried, anxious, confused, all of the above? I worry about their mental health. Older students learn through experiences with their peers, collaborating and sharing ideas in class, in the hall, at their lockers. Their work is their academics and their play or leisure pursuit is their social time with their peers. However, they are in class with six to eight other students, but all looking at their screens, told to face forward, often not able to turn and face the person behind them to collaborate and share their thoughts. They share through their laptops. How can we even call this in-person learning? There is no time for social interaction Yet we are all social beings. There are no school plays, school dances, time in the hall, even time to hang by their locker. And the kids can't even put their belongings in their locker for the day. I'm well aware space is the real issue, space to distance, eat, take a water break. And Heather, I know you said in a normal year, you would be walking through the halls of the school, peeking in the classrooms, making connections as the school board chair. I know with COVID, you said you are unable to go in, but I urge you, Heather, and every single one of I'm you- Sorry, Ms. Hughes, board, it's been about three minutes and 30 seconds. I just, I would urge you all to put a mask on and go in to the schools and see for yourself. You are Thank essential. You. Thank you for Thank your you, time. Stacey. Thank you so much. Um, next, we have Chris Straw. Hi, can you hear me? I can. Thank you, Chris. I, uh, so uh, as an initial matter, uh, thank you all for your service. Uh, I would not want to be in your place right now. Um, and uh, beyond that, I just wanted to say I completely understand uh, all of the community's frustration with the situation. 
Um, but I think a, a key aspect that's being lost in this discussion that I would just encourage the board to really emphasize, because I think um, it's the key point for me, is the reason we're in this environment is not only to stop the spread of this disease, but the governor has set forth criteria that we are obligated to follow as a school, as a district, as a town with respect to reopening and what is permitted with respect to students being in, uh, in school, in the classroom, the size of the classroom, ventilation, everything else. Those are criteria set down by the state. It's not within the school board's power to waive those criteria. It's not within the town council's power. It's not within us individual people's power to waive it. We have an obligation to follow the criteria set forth by the governor with respect to when people can go back in person. So I would just encourage you, I know you had it in a little of your messaging, but I think it's getting lost in the shuffle that this isn't a, an issue where you have the ability to just say tomorrow, we're all going back in person. You are constrained, you are restricted in your ability to make any decisions along those lines. So I totally hear the frustration in the community. And I would perhaps suggest the way that people in the community can try to come up with something is please look at those criteria from the governor. Those criteria that we cannot meet, if you have some ingenious way for us to meet them, I think that would be very productive for everyone to hear. But absent coming up with a solution such that we can meet the criteria that we currently cannot meet with our current facilities, with our current staffing levels, I, I, I hear the frustration, but I do just think it's important to message the fact that we as a community are constrained by those and we don't have the ability to just strike off on our own. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Next is Scott Cohen. Uh, I believe you should have the ability to speak at this point. Now you do maybe. Scott, are you there? You would have to unmute yourself? Yes. There this you is go. Not, Great. Scott Cohen. Hi. Hi. Hi, sorry about that. That's okay. Uh, sure, so I live at Four Farms Edge Road. Um, I have two children, one's at Pine Cove, one's at Cape Elizabeth Middle School. Um, and I have a four part question that's under three minutes. Uh, first- Can um, I just, can I start, but we won't take this out of your timing, but just as a reminder, these are comments. Um, and I just want to, we're not going to answer questions. We will listen to your questions, but this is not a, a back and forth, just to remind you. Fair enough. Okay. Okay, okay good. We'll so, restart the clock. Thank you. Th thank you, Heather. Um, first, I'm concerned that your policies are inadvertently putting our teachers, staff, and children in danger. Uh, let me explain that. When there's no school, my children go to Riverview Martial Arts. Um, there they interact with children and adults from outside of Cape Elizabeth. If my children were at school five days a week, their teachers and classmates would be exponentially safer. So you sent out a survey um, and I was hoping you could add something to the survey that would address this concern. Um, second, according to the American Journal of, of Ophthalmology, Children who are on screens for long durations will be far more likely to suffer from myopia and other eye-related ailments. And according to the National Institute of Health, children who have more than two hours a day of screen time end up getting lower scores on thinking and language tests. Can you add a question to your survey that will help us learn how many hours on average children are on their screens when they should be at school? Um, third, According to the CDC, from April through October of 2020, hospitals saw a 24% increase in mental health emergencies for children from the ages of 5 to 11, and a 31% increase in mental health emergencies for children ages 12 to 17. Um, your survey had a question that <laughs> essentially asked, you know, uh, what do you like most about not having school? Can you replace that question with the following? To what extent, if any, have you seen your child's mental state degrade due to the isolating effects of not being in school? And finally, according to the American Academy of Pediatrics, suicide is now the second leading cause of death 
for children above the age of nine. Can your survey include a question that will help us understand how prevalent this issue may become in our community if we don't open the schools five days a week? Thank you. Uh, next is Liz Kirby. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes, thank you, Liz. Okay, um, a lot of what I wanted to say has already been said, but basically I just wanted to say, um, my name is Liz Kirby. Uh, my husband and I live in Cape Elizabeth at 20 Surf Road. Our daughter is a hybrid kindergarten student at Pond Cove. Uh, I grew up in Cape Elizabeth and attended Cape schools and was really excited to move my family back to Cape Elizabeth when we had kids. Um, I, we've been really disappointed lately with the school's, you know, hybrid learning program. Cape Elizabeth is a town with unrivaled human capital and should be a leader and an innovator. And instead, it seems we've been content to accept the same approach as most other districts. We have countless doctors, lawyers, and business leaders in our town who would love the chance to work with the administration on solutions. Unfortunately, these resources have been left untapped and our children are suffering. Our family stands with the Cape Elizabeth Parent Committee for Education and asking the school board to act urgently on the requests of that group. We must work together as a community to come up with creative ways for the children to return to school full time and in person as soon as possible. One thing that has become apparent is that our interests need to be represented in Augusta. I'm wondering if the school board has hired a lobbyist or an attorney to interface with the main department of education. If not, has the board asked Cape Elizabeth citizens to volunteer for such a role. These are the type of avenues the board should be exploring in addition to finding creative solutions to address the current guidelines. Finally, in the unfortunate event that schools cannot reopen this academic year, I would like to request that the school board can commit to and communicate with the public about plans for the next academic year as soon as possible. Parents in this town are under immense pressure and the need to find alternative educational options needs to begin right now. If the town is looking at another year of hybrid education, we need to know now. Our family for one, and I know that there are others, will be looking for alternative placements for both of our children outside of CAPE should CAPE not return to full-time in-person learning in the fall. And given that we moved to this town and that I grew up here, that would be extremely heartbreaking, but we truly see no other choice given the impact that we've seen on this model on our children. That's really it. So thank you so much. Thank you, Liz. Um... We are at the, we are actually over the 20 minute mark. Um, so it is time for the board to continue discussing um, and decide if we want a lot more time or um, move on with the rest of the agenda. So this is an open discussion for the board at this point. Is there anybody who would like to comment or speak or weigh in? Are you looking for comments from the board, Heather? I am, sorry if that wasn't yeah. clear. I have gotten feedback that my um, audio is not great tonight, so I apologize if I'm coming in and out. Yes, please, Kimberly. Um, uh, I would welcome another 10 minutes of comments if, um, if there are still people interested in sharing their thoughts. Other comments from the board? Um, I would reiterate that um, what you said at the start of the meeting, Heather, that the nature of our school board meetings is not a public forum. It's not a town hall. Although I can definitely speak for myself that I appreciate the public comments. And we do have a presentation from the community members tonight on these same topics. I would say that in order for us to get through our business meeting, you know, we've had some meetings that have lasted upwards to almost six hours that um, at this point, I think we've, we've definitely heard the voices. 
of our community. I understand them clearly. And so for that, I would say, um, let's stop it at the 20, past 20 minute mark, which we're at right now. Other comments from the board or thoughts? The one thing I don't want to do, Heather, is um, miss out on any comments that might be pertaining to something different. And I'm not sure if there's a way to hear any public comment that might not be on the um, reopening of schools, which I know is critical. And we have heard it from many community members. So I don't know if there's an option to hear if there's anyone with their hand raised that has a different topic or a different communication that they want to convey to us. I think that's interesting, Jen. So if I can just clarify and see if I understand you well, you would be open to extending the discussion a little bit if it has to do with something else that is on the agenda that is not about COVID and reopening schools. Is that what I'm hearing from you? That I, yeah, I just don't want to see a voice lost that may have something else that they're concerned about and have not had that opportunity. Okay, that's, that's a thought. I would say though, at this point, the time is, is passed. We do have our general business meeting to go over. We will hear from the community in a presentation and we are always open to email and we read every email that comes across. So if it is something that is not of this um, topic that has not been discussed, know that we are always open to email and we read each and every one of them. Good point, thank you, Laura. Anybody else in the board? So I concur with Laura and Jen in my own way, which is I would, I would say that if there is um, a member of the public that had a different agenda item that they were eager to speak to the board about that we extend by, you know, three minutes, um, and um, it feels like that the board has really heard um, through emails and through public comment tonight, um, the variety of um, parent input on um, COVID and reopening schools. And I'm sure there's more out there, but um, we do have a business meeting to get through. So I guess my wish would be just for you, Heather, to, to kind of ask if there's someone who has a different agenda item in particular to speak to and otherwise we move on. That's just my thought. There's a few board members that haven't spoken. If you would like to weigh in on this, if you're interested and you don't have to, but you have a thought around it, I'm happy to listen. Yeah, no, I guess I'll speak. Um, this is Phil, that makes sense to me, Elizabeth. Um, uh, obviously we want to hear from people and we have been hearing from people. Um, and so we want to keep hearing from people in terms of the emails. Um, this is our policy. So 20 minutes, I, you know, we have a presentation from the parents group and I, uh, that we put on the agenda. So I'd like to, I'd like to move to that quite frankly. And I'd like to move to the COVID updates that we're going to hear from the administration. I think that's, um, something that everyone in the community wants to hear. We're hearing some of it too. It's the first time and this is our business meeting after all. So I want to, I'd like to move along too, but I do appreciate what I've, what I've heard and I hope that people continue to keep on writing. So Phil, just to um, clarify, am I hearing that you would like to stop with public comment right now or be open to public comment that is not about COVID and opening the agenda if there that, is? Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, that makes a lot of sense okay. to me. I just wanna make sure because we do, uh, if there's something other, we wanna hear, obviously we have to hear all issues. So if there's something that people wanna speak about okay. that, is on the agenda that's okay. not about the COVID issue that we should probably hear that. So in the effort of moving forward and not silencing you, Cynthia, Cindy, I get confused by your name on there. Um, if you want to speak, that's fine. Do you like the suggestion put on the table? I was going to agree with what Phil said. I am very appreciative of all the comments we've received, but um, I, I do think we need to, to move on unless there are uh, commenters with other topics. Okay, so thank you, Cindy. It sounds like a, um, Kimberly, how do you feel about that? Are you okay with that suggestion? I'm fine with that. I think, um, yeah, I, I think that there are a lot of people that would like to be 
heard. I think um, we are absolutely reading every email. And I think um, if you did not get a chance to speak tonight and you have things that you're concerned about, please send an email. Okay, so this is not requiring of a vote, um, but I'm getting the consensus. And if somebody doesn't agree with it, please speak up. But I'm gonna offer um, anybody in the public who has something to say and speak um, about something other than COVID and the reopening school, something that is on the agenda, um, could you please raise your hand? And I do see a few people with their hands raised. If you could double check your email uh, or your, I'm sorry, your hand and make sure that um, it's not left up, that would be appreciated. Um, let's go with Josh D. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Um, and I'm going to pronounce your name wrong. And I'm so, I apologize. Vedia? Vedi? Hi, it's Vedihi. Vedihi. Okay, thank you. My apologies. Yep. Uh, thank you for letting me in. Uh, I did have a few points to make, but they were related to COVID and they were related to reopening and getting back to five days a week. But um, apart from okay. those, I did have another question or pointer. Uh, does the school have any plans in place at this point for the um, for, for all the kids who are going to eventually come out of this and when we do go back to school, uh, will have had mental issues or emotional issues or are behind on education in some form and fill the educational <laughs> gaps. Uh, I just am curious about plans on that, uh, apart from the fact that we we'll go back to school when we will and how are we gonna deal with that? Okay, thank you for that. Um, I encourage people to continue listening to updates. Um, and just as a reminder, this is, as everybody knows, a very fluid situation. Um, every time that I speak to Superintendent Wolfram, I find something new. Um, things are, are shifting and um, being created. So it's important to listen to updates, read email updates, check in with the FAQ, and we will do our best to try to answer um, as many questions as we can. Um, again, Josh D, if you are wanting to speak about something that is not about the return to school, something that is not about COVID, um, we have other things on the agenda, um, policy, please go ahead or, and speak, or the building project. Good, good evening, thank you all for uh, what you did tonight and being here. Um, I just wanted to get my hand up and speak, uh, obviously related to COVID, but am not able to because of your request. Um, so all thank I you will say- for respecting that. Um, all gonna, I will gonna, say- I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop you right there. We, we had a respectful conversation with the board um, to not have more follow-up on COVID. So um, we not, invited people with goodwill. COVID. Oh, I, okay. I wasn't going to speak on COVID. I, I was just Okay, it sounded like you were, then my apologies. Thank you very much. Uh, I just wanted to say uh, as, a, as a taxpayer and a citizen of this town that it, it does really upset me um, and... Uh, and really disheartening that you don't allow uh, more time for people to speak um, and give their opinion on this. I think that 20 minutes is absolutely um, absurd. Um, and you, you know, your direct comments uh, were that people, uh, this is not a, um, a open, you know, basically conversation meeting. Um, and I can't remember the exact terminology used. Um, but uh, I just, I, I think that it doesn't do much justice to uh, all the families in this town, whether you're on the pro school side on, on reopening or on staying hybrid uh, to allow only 20 minutes. I understand that that meeting could, this meeting could potentially go for hours because of that. Um, and I understand there's an agenda. Josh, I'm gonna jump in here. This is Elizabeth Seifrey speaking, and I know we know each other quite well. Um, if you have an issue with the policy, I would love for you to attend policy committee and um, bring your thoughts there because I am the policy chair and that's a pretty appropriate place for you to bring your concerns. And if you want, um, stick around. We have an announcement for when the next policy committee meeting will be happening and you're welcome to zoom on in there with us. 
Perfect. That'd be great. Uh, and if you guys want to help with our child care, that'd be awesome too. That way I can make time for that. Thank you. And okay. I also want to give a so plug to like the community we're services. Moving, they, they are doing a great job. Thank you for they, bringing that up. We're going to move on, John. Thank you so much. And thank you for all who spoke and commented. I am moving on to item four, comments from our student rep. So Joey and Ellie, we are listening. Hi everyone. Uh, now we're definitely gonna be taking it into a bit of a different direction. Um, I'm gonna talk about our club and organization reports, which is mainly focused on this is what the student council is currently talking about. Um, but so the junior student council is currently in a holding period waiting to determine whether or not we can have a prom. We had decided on having a senior night held at CEHS with food trucks and many activities as opposed to a prom due to a lot of feedback saying that a traditional prom wouldn't be very fun. Following the guidelines, a traditional prom would require everyone to dance in their own bubble with a mask and six feet apart from everyone else. On top of that, all the seniors wouldn't be able to attend at the same time. That being said, last week, Janet Mills released new guidelines saying outside events could be held at 100% capacity after May 26th, and our senior night is planned for May 29th. Currently, we're feeling out the possibility of having all seniors attend an outside event on May 29th. We haven't looked much into a night for the seniors or for the juniors as we're focusing all our efforts on doing something fun for the seniors as their last hurrah. And the Senior Student Council is working hard at helping us plan our senior night slash prom, as well as discussing other end of the year events. And they had a flooding event last week to get people together outside, which was very fun, I heard. And now Joey's gonna uh, take you through the rest of the, of the updates. So looking at some achievements to be noted, just major kudos to the boys and girls ski team. I hear they got first place at their states yesterday. so. Congrats on first place. I think that's an, another example of where Cape Athletics is uh, dominant within this region, especially at skiing. I also, I don't want to take too much bluster out of the debate team's presentation, right? This is kind of a staple of my report at this point, so you know I have to go forward. Uh, out during the state competition, the debate team earned first place overall. The speech team earned third place and Congress came in fourth place overall. So another strong showing from Cape Forensics and I'm really proud of uh, that outcome. Looking at some academic topics, our new mini term will be starting next week. So this will be the last, uh, last week of this mini term. So students are prepping to move into their next uh, mini term classes and finishing up the classes they currently are working on. Now, one question that I've gone from a couple of students is that whether we're going to have the mini term system next year and what shape that will take is I think it's a little premature to maybe put out that planning but just uh, something to keep in mind as we move forward for next year's reopening and another announcement that's come through the school system is that AP tests will no longer be mandatory so for some students that's a relief because they weren't uh, too big of a fans of taking a standardized test, but I, I do appreciate the board's flexibility on this matter, especially with the uh, reduction in curriculum time. Looking at the student life report, uh, I think it's a little bit past time to inform people, but we did have a fundraiser at the McDonald's down in Mill Creek, and that ended at seven. So hopefully while well, people were tuned into this school board meeting, they're able to go down to McDonald's, grab a fry, <laughs> grab a shake, and support the project graduation. And I'm sure we'll hear from Mr. Carpenter on who actually won the bike raffle. So hopefully that's someone within the meeting. We have 184 people here. So it is probability sake, it is likely, but uh, that ended at seven o'clock. <laughs> And then spring sports uh, is just starting up. So we're getting really excited about uh, being able to participate. Last year, we didn't have the chance to. So I'm excited to have a tennis season. And I know many others are excited to uh, have the opportunity to play their spring sports for the school. 
And then something really near and dear to my heart is uh, senior transition projects will be moving forward this year. That'll be the week of May 24th. You know, it just gives the students a great opportunity to experience professional environment uh, before their graduation. And I'm very appreciative that that program is able to happen this year. And for student concerns, there's no, no large student concerns that I've heard uh, between last meeting, and I'll keep the board informed if that changes at any point. Does any board members have any questions? Thank you. Thank you, Joey and Ellie. Um, my son participated in the sledding and had a really nice time. So, and I love the creativity for the potential prom options. So, thank you so much. Um, next, I'd like to invite Lisa Melanson. Um, she has permission to talk. She's going to speak and um, introduce our Cape Elizabeth High School State Debate Champion. Right. Thank you, Heather. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Donna, and school board members for your ongoing support of co-curricular activities that involve public speaking and giving youth a chance to uh, gain self-confidence in, in their speaking. And I think that's evidenced by our uh, two student liaisons to the school board, Ellie and Joey, who have done a great job this year. And Joey is our uh, captain for the congressional debate team. Um, and he has done a great job this year of rebuilding a team from scratch. It was all newcomers, um, freshmen and a couple of sophomores and they managed to place a fourth overall. So I was very pleased with the work Joey did as a teacher and a, a team leader. And our debate team, uh, so speech and debate is an umbrella that includes Congress, speech and debate. Um, and debate won its uh, first state championship since we were reconstituted in 2011 with a CIF grant. Uh, and this year had a team that was uh, a combination of depth uh, with Ginia Fisher LaPlante, uh, combined debate camp captain, Swetha Palaniapan and Kyla Christie as public forum captains. We also had seniors Nicoletta Coop and Cecily Trout. And we had sophomores Jack Quinn and uh, sophomore Jack Quinn. And we had freshman Ava Corbin and Tess Straw. Um, and then on the Lincoln Douglas side, we had sophomore Nora Lane and juniors Clara Parker and Virginia Weiss. And uh, they not only won the state championship, but they beat the next, the second place team by about 19 points. So uh, we really crushed it on that day. Speech team finished uh, third overall. And I want to thank our captain on the speech uh, side, uh, Devin Newell, who has led the team this year. And I also want to acknowledge our assistant coach new to the team this year, Dave Register, who uh, graduated from Cape Elizabeth High School in 2006. He was an alumnus of the Cape Theater Department and was in Almost Maine, which had his community theater premiere when he was a senior. Uh, he got his MFA in acting and theater education from Columbia University. So when I realized we were in uh, remote mode this year, I got in touch with him to see if he could be an assistant coach. And he brought his, not just his theater expertise, but his uh, knowledge of education um, to offer excellent feedback to our speech students. And we ended up with two individual state champions on the speech team. That was Sonia Wold, sophomore in dramatic interpretation and senior Ben Stone in storytelling. So uh, I want to send congratulations to the students and the work they did this year. And uh, parents, since there are so many of you in attendance tonight, and you have students right now in Pond Cove and the middle school, uh, I urge you to you know, uh, encourage your own children uh, to try out an extracurricular activity like speech and debate or model UN or uh, many of the other activities. But um, 
it's, it's a place where kids can be competitive academically, they can share intellectual ideas, they can be curious. Um, we had topics ranging from lethal autonomous weapons and whether states should ban, ban them to uh, whether the CMP pipeline uh, should be uh, built. So I think it encourages our students to be global citizens and good communicators. And in debate, you have to listen to both sides of an issue and you have to articulate cases on both sides of the issue, something that is invaluable in, in today's uh, society. So I don't know if I've left anything out. Uh, I hope I haven't, um, but thanks again with everything that's going on you thought to invite us uh, to the meeting tonight to receive your congratulations. So we're appreciative of that. And I know my students are here in attendance. You can't see them, unfortunately. Um, I'll just add one more thing, Heather. It was a year ago this month that you invited the speech team to the, to the school board meeting for congratulations on winning states last year. And we scrunched together for a photo with all of you. And it was about five days later that we went remote uh, so it's a full year, um, and I'm appreciative of what the school board has done and the principals uh, in keeping us all together and keeping students engaged at the high school. So thank you. Thank you, Lisa. And I was <clears throat> losing my voice. Yeah, um, I would love to congratulate all the students for all their hard work and for your guidance, as well as the other coach. Um, and I was going to say the exact same thing that um, typically we would um, all come together, uh, all stand up and applaud these students for their accomplishment. Um, I just want the public to know again that they are in the audience, so I can't see you all um, know how grateful, uh, not grateful, but how impressed I think we all are, how much you give and how, your curiosity uh, and, and interest in um in debating and, and going through this. So um, we can't see you, but mm -hmm. we're seeing you in our own way virtually here, which is funky. But thank you for um, all the explanation, Lisa, um, and sharing everything that you have with us. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Next up, we have a pre uh, presentation by the Cape Elizabeth, excuse me, Cape Elizabeth Parent Committee for Education. And we have invited for uh, Aaron Belfort, uh, Nancy Thompson, and Liz Brownell. Alexander Parsons are here to speak. So you all have um, permission to speak. You um, can unmute yourself. Um, and as we had mentioned, there's um, sort of a 15 minute slot. We usually consider about 10 minutes, but um, you ask for a little more time. So. Um, we're going to be quiet as a board, and um, it, it's all yours, so you have the floor. I do wish that there's a way for your faces to be seen, but I've been told that um, in this format, um, unfortunately, you can't turn on your vision, so um, I apologize for that, but we will listen intently and carefully to you, so thank you for being here. Uh, thank you, Heather, uh, and thank you to the board. Uh, my name, I'm going to kick this off. Uh, my name is Alex Parsons. Uh, I'm a professor and a dad to three, uh, we'll call them semi-feral children. Uh, we live at 43 Stony Brook Road, and we have daughters in both Pond Cove and the middle school, and uh, our son will also enter kindergarten at Pond Cove Elementary this fall. Um, in the spirit of CAPE's impressive tradition of debate, which I've been learning about this evening and enjoyed hearing, uh, and on behalf of our loose gathering of CAPE parents, um, I'd like to thank the board for the opportunity to present and more our community of parents for their collaboration and advocacy. We are here because of what we all share, our urgent concern for our children and their teachers, the value we place on education, our investment in healthy debate, and our desire to solve those pressing problems that beset our community. We are here because we are all invested in CAFE as a community that serves its citizens with innovation and resourcefulness, that leads by example, and that unites around crises. We are here because in the midst of the pandemic, 
We want to serve our children and their teachers better. We want our district to exhibit that same innovation and resourcefulness. We want CAPE to lead and respectfully, we want to do it together. Now, the pandemic began a year ago. CAPE educators and administrators work diligently to open schools two days a week, create virtual learning plans and apply an infrastructure to support a system no one had had to contemplate. And we are deeply thankful for such dedication and effort, truly. And at the start, the fix worked, but it worked as a tourniquet, addressing the immediate damage of the pandemic. The hybrid model is not and cannot be considered other than a temporary fix that has now outlasted its efficacy. The constriction of our children's educational and social interaction and their isolation has become a new crisis, a crisis in educational and mental health deficits. We are all in agreement here. Parents see it, teachers see it, administrators see it, the board sees it, and heard it tonight. We want to do everything we can to prevent our children from enduring this for any longer than absolutely necessary. Other main communities face their own unique obstacles and recognize this urgency. For the sake of our children, teachers, and community, we want to learn from their successful examples and join you in the effort to improve the outlook for our children. Now with that, I'd like to turn to Aaron Belford, a fellow Cape parent and child and adolescent psychiatrist, after which we will hear, hear from Tim and Nancy Thompson. Thank you. So my name is Erin Belfort and I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist and I'm also the mom of a five and eight year old here in Cape. And Heather, I live next door to your parents who are about the best neighbors one could ask for. <laughs> and I'm speaking on behalf of myself this evening uh, based on- Thank my you. You're welcome, they're lovely. Um, I'm sort of speaking on my own behalf this evening, not on behalf of my employer. So I'm speaking uh, based on my experience as a physician dedicated to childhood mental health. And uh, I also want to just really echo the thanks and appreciation for our unbelievable teachers and our administrators who a year ago rapidly adapted to a new modality of teaching with grace, patience, and incredible commitment. I have enormous respect for our teachers and for all of you. So thank you for what you do. I was asked to speak tonight about the mental health impacts of COVID-19 and the resultant remote learning. And the data will be coming out about this for years, but those of us who work in pediatrics and pediatric mental health are worried. I treat kids from all over the state and from all walks of life. And I wanna just highlight a number of concerns that are relevant, including safety, equity, social isolation, demoralization, and depression. Starting with safety, School is a place of structure, support, and purpose for children. And for others, school is also a place of safety, a place to escape tension or worse, violence at home, a place to get two warm meals a day, a place to see the smiling and supportive faces of teachers, counselors, nurses, administrators, and coaches, a place to develop self-esteem, which comes with a sense of emerging competency. Relative absence of this safety and structure can have negative impacts on the mental health of children. As one example, reports of child abuse and neglect are down around much of the country. Unfortunately, this doesn't mean that abuse and neglect themselves are down, but rather that kids are interfacing less with teachers and other mandated reporters. Teachers and school personnel are often the gatekeepers for noticing safety or mental health concerns among students. My second concern is around equity. We all know that not all children learn and process information in the same ways. COVID-19 and remote learning have disproportionately impacted those with learning differences or specialized IEP needs. Kids who were behind their peers pre-COVID are likely to be even more so today. For many reasons, families struggle to adequately supervise and attend to the learning needs of their children. Furthermore, some children, particularly the younger kids, really don't learn well on a screen. They learn in the context of their relationship with their teacher with attentive and timely support and with peer interaction. Learning for many is inherently social and it's about connection, something which is greatly diminished by remote learning. My next concern is about isolation. We know that isolation and loneliness are risk factors for depression, anxiety, and other mental health disorders. 
Social isolation has hit my adolescent patients the hardest. It has disrupted their normal developmental tasks. Adolescents are meant to explore and consolidate their identities. They ask, who am I? It's a big question. Answering occurs in the context of social relationships, mostly with peers. They navigate friendships, they explore intimacy. They practice independence and autonomy away from their families, skills that they will need for adulting. Even for a generation comfortable connecting on a screen, the exhaustion of more than a year of this sole means of connecting with each other is palpable. The lack of structure and purpose combined with social isolation, missing sports and other important milestones leads many to feel demoralized and hopeless. In the absence of a fully formed frontal lobe, which is the part of our brain that helps us take perspective and imagine future consequences, it's hard for young people to see the light at the end of the tunnel. This feels like forever to them. And relatively speaking, when you've only lived 14 years, it is. I Zoomed with two patients on Friday who had stopped going to school. One was a freshman, previously an honor roll student. The teacher called her mom to say she hadn't attended remote class for two weeks. This was news to the mom who was busy at work and not able to be home to supervise her child and assumed she was doing okay. The second was a senior who got so behind and overwhelmed that he stopped going. When he found out he won't graduate on time, he just said he was giving up and he was thinking about getting a GED instead. Finally, depression and anxiety are on the rise. Early data suggests suicidal thinking and suicide attempts among youth are increasing. We know that school attendance is a protective factor against negative mental health outcomes. It is also linked to longitudinal outcomes, including pursuing higher education, earning potential, and improved mental health. In sum, COVID-19 and remote learning are amplifying isolation, demoralization, depression, and other mental health disorders. We must weigh the impacts of prolonged remote learning, not just on academic achievement, but in terms of the mental health and well-being of our students, particularly for those who are more vulnerable. I'd like to end on a hopeful note. Every day I marvel at the resilience of young people. Children are resilient, families are resilient, our community is resilient. With collaboration, transparency, and some creative thinking, even within the existing guidelines and guidance from the state, we could create solutions to get our kids back to more in-person learning and to repair their mental health. Thank you so much for your time. And I'm going to turn it over now to Tim and Nancy Thompson. Good evening, can you hear me? Yes, thank you, Nancy. <clears throat> Thanks, this is uh, Nancy Thompson. I'm here tonight with my husband, Tim. We live at Six Pine Ridge Road. And for those of you that don't know the Thompsons, uh, we moved to Cape Elizabeth about 35 years ago and raised five kids that all attended our outstanding schools. We feel very fortunate to live in such a great community. And I can't stress enough to you that we love this town. We love this community and we love the school system. And we appreciate all that everyone has done to help us educate and develop our children into the fine young adults they are today. For the past 16 years at the beginning of every school year in the high school cafeteria, Tim and I gather with every staff member of the school system, every teacher, administrator, bus driver, custodian and cafeteria worker, basically anyone who comes in contact with your children in our schools. This is the kickoff to a new academic year and it's our opportunity to hand out a special award called the Thompson Award to a staff member of the school system that goes above and beyond what is expected, providing a lasting and meaningful impact on Cape Elizabeth students. Every year it becomes more difficult to select just one recipient because we have so many incredible people that make up our school system. This award is so meaningful to us because it is in memory of our middle child, Timmy. Timmy attended all three schools and graduated from Cape Elizabeth High School in June of 2004. You couldn't find a child that was prouder than him to represent his town. Every time he hit the field or the gym with a maroon and gold Cape Elizabeth logo, he would beam from ear to ear. It's hard to overstate the importance that Timmy's teachers and coaches had in his life, especially someone like Ben Raymond, who was the first official recipient of the Thompson Award. 
We could count on Ben during school hours and after school hours for another set of eyes and ears in support of our Timmy. It's hard to imagine how that special support and encouragement is not happening today during this pandemic. Unfortunately for Timmy, his senior year added a lot of stress for him. He developed depression, depression and at the end of his senior year, he died by suicide shortly after graduation. I never knew anything about depression or anxiety or suicide until it hit me and my family head on in, the July, of, in July of 2004. Since then, I've become an expert in a field that no one wants to become an expert in. One thing that I've learned in the last 16 years is to be an advocate. I advocate for those who can't and those that aren't here to advocate for themselves. I know firsthand how difficult it has been for young parents in this town. I personally have driven to Richmond, Virginia to help my granddaughter, Audrey, with her first grade virtual learning. It's such a difficult way to teach, not only for the teacher, but also for the child and the family. I witnessed firsthand my daughter and son-in-law's difficult task of trying to help Audrey while both having to be on their own Zoom calls for work. It is very challenging to say the least. I'm here tonight because I'm deeply concerned. I'm concerned that each day as we delay getting our children back to school, it will compound the future fallout of this generation. I can't turn on the TV or pick up a newspaper without seeing a story or an article on the emotional trauma that is occurring to our youth. I also see how the suicide rates are skyrocketing all over the state and country. This pandemic has created, you know, created a tsunami for the mental health of all of us. And this is only the beginning. I spoke this past week with the Director of Suicide Prevention at NAMI in Augusta. And for those of you who aren't familiar, NAMI stands for the National Alliance on Mental Illness, whose mission is to support, educate, and advocate for building better lives for the one in four Mainers who are affected by mental illness. He told me that he is busy visiting school systems throughout the state and is giving talks on the impact of COVID-19 on mental health and safety of Maine students. During our conversation, he talked about how the pandemic impacts all of us on a daily basis by the changes in our schedules, our basic needs, our finances, our sense of safety and our sense of hope. But for our youth, all of these are compounded by not having access to their friends, their peer interactions, their uncertainty about their future, their destruction of their sports and other group activities. And they watch how their parents are dealing with this as well. As he clearly put it, he said, the stress is enormous. He also explained that depression and anxiety and substance abuse have increased dramatically as a result of isolation, uncertainty and fear. There's a lot of pressure on everyone, but this is the time to build hope. We can see that the vaccines are on the way and we are not alone. In fact, our teachers are being vaccinated right now, so hope really is on the way. My husband and I have learned a lot as a result of the loss of our son, Timmy, and that speaking up about mental illness, we know saves lives. After the fallout of the Stoneman Douglas incident in 2018, Tim and I knew that we needed to do something proactive in our community to combat mental illness. We raised monies along with SEAF and developed a new initiative called the Thompson Mental Health Initiative in the Cape Schools to make sure that we talk about the mental health of our children. Two years ago, we worked di diligently with our middle school nurse, Jill Young, who happened to be last year's Thompson Award winner. Jill worked tirelessly with the You Will Be Found Mental Health Initiative. This initiative helps students become more familiar with their own mental health so we can stop the stigma associated with it and access help if they should need to. We wanted kids to know that they don't need to suffer alone and that there's help and hope for them. Jill applied for a grant through the CEF and orchestrated Finding Perfect at Cape Elizabeth Middle School Read Along. All four grades in the Cape Elizabeth Middle School participated in a read along book titled Finding Perfect. The main character was a little girl that was struggling with severe anxiety and obsessive compulsiveness. Every student in the middle school had a chance to discuss and read this book, which united not only all the students at CEMS, but involved the greater Cape community. 
Several community members read aloud a chapter, including our town manager, our police chief, our legislators, our administrators, et cetera. This showed that we are all in this together as a community of caring adults, and we are here to help. We know that you have big problems to solve, and we would like to be a part of the solution. For example, we know that there are lots of classrooms that need to be assembled, and we could provide volunteers to help get that done. And you know, Tim and I would be the first in line to help. We also know that you're required to work within the guidelines set by Maine CDC and DOE. Ms. Thompson, question... I'm so sorry to interrupt you. I'm yep. the timekeeper and it's been about 16 minutes and 30 seconds. Do you feel I've like you're able to less wrap than up? 30 seconds left? Yeah, this excellent. Is my Go for it. Go Thank for you. it. My question to you, Elizabeth, is how can we collectively with concerned parents advocate for the additional flexibility in the guidelines that you need to open the schools more completely and get our kids back to school safely. Again, we are here to help. In closing, I can't stress enough how impacting it is by not having our kids back in school full time. And I worry about the mental health of our children. You see, life is hard enough when things are somewhat normal, but now we're living through an extremely difficult time during this pandemic. And I feel that the fatigue is becoming too great for all of our children. Again, I urge you to work with the greater community to come up with some solutions to get our youth back to school full time. And thank you all for what you do. Please know we fully support all of our teachers and staff and only want what is best for all. Thank you. And if I may, I would just like to close in a few seconds um, and with this. Recognizing the urgency of the crisis, we respectfully ask to meet with the school board and administration in the next seven days in a special session to present, discuss, and debate some proposed solutions. We understand the feasibility issues involved and understand that we must work within the requirements of the MDOE framework, but our community stands ready to do whatever it takes to get this done, to do it safely, but to get it done. When it comes to education, we are leaders. It is time to build bridges, to come together, and it is time for us all together to lead. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I just want to remind the public as well, um, as that was a lot about the mental health that we have guidance counselors, social workers, we have nurses, teachers, principals um, that are all eager to help. Um, I spoke to some specifically today and um, they are there to support. So please reach out if you do have any concerns or worries in that regard. Moving on, we have principal, up, uh, I'm sorry, I jumped ahead. We have a COVID update from our superintendent. Thank you, Heather. As the, has been said a couple times tonight, but I would just like to restate that as a public school district, we are required to follow the six main DOE requirements. We have received over a million dollars in federal funding, and that has provided technology for our instruction this year, additional staffing, and most recently our ventilation projects that are nece uh, necessary for improving air quality and allowing more students in our classrooms. Non-compliance with the six M MDOE guidelines would require us to return the money that we have received and would disqualify us from any additional federal funding. So vaccinations is one of the things that um, is changing, has changed this week. Uh, we're working to get staff appointments for vaccinations. Uh, Maine Department of Education is trying to set up clinics for 60 plus staff. So staff who are uh, 60 years old and older and other staff have made appointments through Hannaford, Walgreens and Walmart for vaccinations. It would appear at this time that all staff who want vaccinations should be full, fully vaccinated by the end of May. And that's just an estimate of um, thinking about how many there are to vaccinate and thinking about the, um, the two vaccinations that are necessary. Because of changes in the sites of the vaccination clinics, we've had to submit the spreadsheet of information to three different sites at three different times and communicate to teachers uh, at three, uh, to staff at three different times about the three different and changing ways about how they will be contacted. And that's been since Friday. 
Due to some information that was circulating on Friday, over 600 staff, many of them our staff, signed up and received confirmation regarding vaccinations that was incorrect. And then they received cancellations of those appointments and had to look elsewhere. Just the vaccination issue has taken a great deal of time for us to sort out in the past week. Uh, surveys. A survey went out to teachers and went to parents to gather information that will be studied as we make plans for providing more in-school time for students. The staff survey closes, I believe, at nine, uh, noon on Thursday and the parent survey um, on Friday. So we will be looking at that information. Uh, we couldn't ask every single question that um, people have requested, but probably there will be another survey as we move through the process. My office has been researching tents, portables, and alternate facilities such as commercial real estate over the past few weeks. We're in the process of reserving several tents, which will provide for some outdoor learning space, as well as some possible eating space. As of last Friday, our biggest challenge to students returning back to school full-time was classroom space, eating space, and staffing. In regards to portables, Pond Cove costs for portables and staffing, not including electricity, water, and setup uh, would be a, for a year, would be approximately uh, $330,000. That would be 15 portable rentals. Staffing would be, a, would cost approximately $2,400,000 to staff those portables. For the middle school, um, a cost for portables and staffing, not including electricity, water, and setup. Um, would, could be appro approximately $66,000 with for three rentals and $480,000 for staffing. We're also looking at the possibility of renting some commercial space to turn into classrooms such as the WEX building in South Portland. We haven't visited there yet to see if the space is suitable. And we were looking at some other commercial uh, properties in the area. Meanwhile, the governor issued new orders last Friday that included simplifying and standardizing capacity limits and establishing a clear time frame. This change states for indoor gatherings, the percentage of capacity will increase to 50% starting May 26th and 75% starting, oh, sorry, March 26th and 75% starting May 24th. This change has a significant impact on our ability to feed our students under the present requirement of six foot social distancing with only allowing 50 students to be gathered in a space at a time. So that was the, the past requirement would only allow 50 students. This change is huge for school because it would allow us to have more students um, in our cafeterias and in our gyms for eating. This change will allow us to accommodate all of our students at six feet distancing in Pond Cove and the middle school and eliminates one giant hurdle that we've been facing, where to feed our students. So we found that out on Friday. A team has been meeting to discuss plans for moving forward. We have increased our meeting times and have been meeting every week for two hours at a time. At our meeting today, we continue to work on the brainstorm list of options. We have identified three goals for our work. First goal, safety of students and staff. Goal two, student learning, assessment and equity. Three, social and emotional well being of students and teachers. We've been discussing plans for the rest of the year as well as plans for next year. We've talked about possibilities, roadblocks, solutions. Would the option help us to meet our three goals? And is the option feasible? Can we as a district organization and with the information and conditions at the present time accomplish this with the many factors that have to be considered? We realize that in looking at these options, the requirements and guidelines may, may quite possibly change during the process and influence the feasibility of our plans, such as a change in state requirements, increasing positive numbers or decreasing positive numbers. As review options, we have listed the various factors that we must consider in regarding the option, in regard to the options, such as transportation. We are still under the social distancing requirement of three feet for students on our buses. 
a limited number of buses and a limited number of bus drivers feeding our students. Under the options, do we have the capacity to feed and the space can, to contain our students with social distancing requirements of six feet? Space in our classrooms. Students must be three feet apart and they must always be six feet from any adults in the room. Adults must be six feet apart. How would the option impact those who are health compromised, both our teachers and our students? When we bring all students back full time, will, be able to, will we be able to offer these members of our community remote learning or would everyone have to come back? If everyone comes back, do we have space for them in our classrooms? Would we need more classrooms? What about teachers who are teaching a combination of remote and hybrid? How would we reorganize their positions? Would students be placed in other classrooms with other teachers? What about high school teachers who are certified in their content areas and teach a combination of grades within their classes? If we use our gyms for eating, which we would have to do, what would we do with fit as phys ed classes on rainy or snowy days? If we already have limited classrooms, where would our students go for these periods or classes? What additional materials or furniture would we need to return all students to full time? In many of our classrooms, we have tables instead of desks. We would need to order a significant amount of new desks and chairs in order to seat students socially distanced in our classrooms. What is the availability of desks on order? How soon could we get them? Classroom furniture has been stored for the last year by classrooms. How much of a job would it be to sort out the desks, tables and chairs from each classroom and keep the remaining furniture and materials back in storage. At 15 foot social distancing requirements for band, how would those classes meet? Bringing all students back full time would double the close contact so it would impact the number of students to be quarantined. Instead of eight or nine students identified as close contacts who need to be quarantined, 18 to 20 students would need to be quarantined. And if they tested positive in the process, 18 to 20 families would need to quarantine. What is the impact of the ventilation work at the high school that will not be completed until the after the April break? How would any changes that we make impact the schedule at each school? Required teacher planning time, meeting opportunities for state and federal required meetings such as IEP and 504 meetings and individual support time for students. So as we looked at various options today during our two hour meeting, those are some of the, the things that we had to discuss. All of those things are impacted um, as we make our plans. We are forming a planning committee. Uh, it will be made of two board members, two parents. Um, the board members also have our parents. Um, the A team, three nurses, one to two teachers from each school one Cape Elizabeth Education Association rep representative. Um, this, need, this committee would meet from on Tuesdays from three to four, and hopefully the first meeting will be on March 16th. Um, it will be via Zoom, and we will certainly record the, the session, and hopefully we will allow attendees who can observe the process that we're going through and listen to the conversation. Uh, the goal of the committee would be to develop a recommendation for the school board regarding bringing students back to our school buildings for more in-person learning time for the 2021 school year and for the 21-22 school year. The committee will analyze options for feasibility and roadblocks and brainstorm additional options. This would be a collaborative committee. Um, I heard tonight's... Um, something that seemed to be a more, um, more of a them against us, but this would, the plan for this committee would be to be a truly collaborative committee. Um, another um, topic that we have been talking about is uh, student learning, supporting students. We do have the time on Wednesday morning set aside to support students one-on-one -on -one and in small groups. This time is well utilized by teachers and students for intense student support as we work with students who are struggling during the pandemic. 
Our proposal for the FY22 budget contains one math support person at each school. Some of these positions may be funded by an additional COVID relief funding that we hope to receive. However, it is presently in the budget proposal uh, should the funding not come through. So we are talking about supporting students um, next year and what can we include in our school budget uh, for furthering the support uh, and adding to the support of students. I do continue to meet weekly with the Cumberland County superintendents as we discuss the challenges that the pandemic has presented and the solutions that we are all exploring. Each district is different with different student configurations in the schools different eating facilities, different transportation arrangements, and different staffing needs. However, we all face the same goal, getting our students safely back into school for as much time as possible. I'd like to repeat that the social distancing requirements that we must comply with are our biggest challenge at this time. We realize that the social distancing requirements are necessary for the safety of our students and staff However, we will be able to be ready to put our furniture back in the classroom and lunch areas should the social distancing requirements change. If parents and community members want students back in school for more time, they should be addressing their concerns with those that have the power to make those changes in Augusta. So that's what we've been doing recently to address COVID. Thank you, Donna. I have a, I have a couple questions. Sure. Um, so I, I thank you for reiterating that at the end that, you know, these, these um, policies, these guidelines aren't our guidelines. I think that that can be, you know, from the community, it can seem like, and even in some comments, it's like your policies are what is holding the children back from coming to school. And it's, it's frankly not our policies. But to that end, you said you do meet with the superintendents. What about advocating for flexibility in these guidelines or that, that's, that's been going was, on. what did you say Donna that's been going on through the superintendent uh okay. to the super regional superintendents group and um there are regional superintendents groups throughout the district York County um Western Maine and they're all in constant uh contact actually they meet once a week with um, representatives from the DOE. And there is a, a representative from the DOE that um, sits in on our group meetings as well. So, um, so we are advocating and have been advocating for that. Okay, so that's huge for everybody to understand that we are proactively advocating for the restrictions of these guidelines or some flexibility in that. You mentioned that, what was the date? It was like in the middle of your presentation and I've been on Zoom for like 10 hours for work. So forgive me if I don't remember the exact time, but you said that there is this change in eating, the eating, um, I call them restrictions. So it's, it's really the, a change in the, from the governor in um, her gathering rules. Right. Yeah. And so when does that go into effect, that change? That was March 26th, I believe, for the first one. And then uh, it changes again. That was for 50% uh, capacity. Right. And then 75% capacity was May 24th. So let me just make sure I understand. So May 24th, <laughs> could our children, our students eat within these six feet guidelines? Or, or no, maybe there's no six feet guidelines then for eating. No, it is. It's still six feet guidelines. It's whether that at a six, at, with six feet social distancing, uh, right now half of our we can only use half of uh, the Pond Cove Middle School cafeteria because we can only fit in fifty. According to the guidelines now, it's fifty people in a gathering area. So okay. even though we have more space because it's one huge room, we can only put 50 people in it, but that will change to 50% capacity. Okay, so, and then 75% so, capacity and, and towards and the And then 75, yes, percent capacity, yes. So we will be able to, um, Troy help me out, probably double the number of students that we can uh, seat in that cafeteria. Yeah, so for example, right now, we use our gym, um, and I'm not sure the exact number, but I'm guessing the capacity of our gym, seating capacity, must be 300 maybe or, or so. I don't know for sure. So when that, as of March 26, it will be okay to have 50%. So you could have 150 people. Now, 
the next thing is they all have to be six feet apart. We currently can only have 50 people counting any adults that are in there. So as of March 26, we could probably get around 110 people seats in there because we'll just use the whole gym. Um, mm-hmm. So that's an example of um, really being helpful and not, a, not forcing us to have another lunch period um, to, to take care of feeding all of our kids. So that can happen. In the cafeteria, it looks like maybe 25 or six more um, students could enter the cafeteria with those parameters of the six foot social distance thing. So that really is a pretty big deal. But how does it help, like even come May 24th, when it's 75% capacity, how does that help get us our kids back to school? Because you can have more people in one place. Right now, we can only have, we could have the auditorium and only have 50 people in it. There's a limit to how many people right. in one space. And if what we're moving forward, there, that limit is being removed. And it's going to be a percentage of, that, of the building space. So a larger space can have more people. Um, and by having more people, we can then have more kids that we can feed in, in, a, in an amount of time. Does that make sense? Well, it makes sense, but then it just begs the question, okay, so then come May 24th, then since the, the eating hurdle, we, we, we can leap over the eating hurdle, does that change us going, our kids going back to school. We still have them the classroom hurdle. Right, we still have the classroom hurdle. And I know that you guys looked at, at um, measuring the classrooms again or taking another look at that to see if the three feet, can we squeeze them all in? What was the outcomes of that? We're in the process still of doing that and talking about that, so. Okay, still measuring. Okay, yeah. thank you. I had a follow up just on that specific question. So that maybe this is a good time. Um, it, so maybe you don't know the answer yet. Maybe you're follow, uh, still measuring, but when you um, when you uh, priced out 15 portables, was that was that uh, using a six foot spacing in a classroom or a three feet? Three feet. But the, so, so even using three feet and getting more kids into the existing classrooms, we would need 15 portables for Funko to make it work. Okay. And, and I know that there's also uh, yeah, Americans with Disabilities Act uh, considerations to get into there too. But yeah, that's yeah. that's a question I had. Yeah. And, and the final follow up, and I know, again, I know your preliminary, so I don't want to put you on the spot, but I did notice there was quite a difference between the middle school and Pond Cove estimates, these rough estimates of the number of portables and the and the staffing costs. And I was wondering if you might just be able to address that briefly. It was something like two two point something million in staffing for Punk Cove and four eighty for the middle school. No, um, the middle school has done a closer study at this point, so they were able to come up with those numbers. Um, those numbers are also dependent on um, thinking if all of our remote students stayed remote, so numbers of remote students. Um, would need to would need to say if we added if we added back in those remote students if they all decided to come back say if we did this before the end of the year um that would that would skew our numbers a bit as well so it has to do also with um classroom size the physical size of the classrooms Go ahead, Elizabeth. Donna, I'm gonna try to do, ask you some uh, like elementary public education questions to kind of help the public. So um, when you talk about busing challenges as a public school, do we have to offer busing? We have to offer busing for elementary, which is considered K to eight. Yes. Okay. Legally we have to. And as a public school, um, so we can't just say, hey, parents drive your kids. No. Right. Um, as a public school, do we have to offer school lunch? We have to offer school lunch, yes. Or that it doesn't count as a school day. So, right. <laughs> right. Um, and are are you aware if any like are private schools uh, beholden to the same um, framework and standards that public schools are with regard to the DOE and social distancing and that sort of thing? No, they're not. Great. I just wanted to help the public understand the, di- especially the difference between public and private. Thanks, Elizabeth. Yeah. I have another question about the committee that's being formed. Go ahead, Laura. I do think it's it's important for the community to feel 
heard and to have some kind of exchange. And I tried to reiterate when I voted no for the additional comments, not because I don't want to hear the community because I think it's very important, but because this isn't a, a public format, it's not a these aren't town hall meetings. That's not within the policy that Elizabeth reiterated. So would this community potentially be able to hold information sessions or like how can we get that so that the community can have some you know question and answer so it's not just you know one way delivery of of information that they feel they have more freedom to speak and, and be heard i know email is one thing and i reiterated the email but some people just want the actual vocal exchange in a in a public format these, these um committee members could act as conduits between the community and the committee and bring, uh, if, if people in the community have comments, they could forward them to the, those um, members of the committee and they could bring forward their comments and, and concerns and questions. But who would host, like for instance, a, a, a town hall where, where they could have their, you know, ask their questions and get responses? It wouldn't necessarily be the committee you're saying? No, it's a work. It's a working committee. The committee is going to have a lot of working uh, work to do, just in planning. Okay. Donna, I have a question. There was um, there was a moment tonight through a comment where uh, the public was saying we're waiting to be asked to advocate at the state level for our students. Um, do you think this is a fair opportunity to ask the public to give an official call, please advocate? And would you be willing to explain how or what uh, a parent could do, how they could advocate, what you would suggest for the shifting of the requirements? So, you know, keeping in mind that we realize that these requirements are put in place for, to keep our students and staff safe. Um, and I would never want to do anything that would go against those. And certainly I believe that the CDC knows a lot more than I do about um, the requirements for keeping our students safe. But if there are our parents who feel that um, we don't need these requirements and I, um, that I would certainly encourage them to contact their um, Senator and representative and um, the legislature is meeting right now and also, also so they could go that way. Um, they could also contact the CDC and they could contact the um, main department of education to state their, their feelings. I know that um, they're always open to comments, so. Uh, Kimberly, go ahead. Thank you, Donna. Thank you, Donna. Um, I so the um, I I think Phil had asked, and I was just not clear on the. It seemed like there was a significantly lower number of trailers and staff needed for the or needed um, for the middle school versus the elementary school. Are the class classrooms themselves bigger in the middle school and able to accommodate? Um, a larger group of students so you could get everyone in if the guidelines changed or I, I'm just um, just curious because it seemed like such a substantial difference in uh, in number of trailers needed for the two buildings. But as as things have um, changed and progressed in the last week, we're really just starting to collect that data. So I don't have any, um, what, what I'm looking for from the principals really is some, um, measurements and class sizes, and we, I haven't gotten those yet, so. Thank you very much. Um, and with, so I, I recognize that regardless of the change in um, capacity for the cafeteria and gym, the, the big spaces of the classrooms themselves continued to, um, to pose challenges. Um, would the 50% capacity for the cafeteria and gyms be sufficient to house our students or 
the 75% capacity um, or do we really need the 100%? I, I know um, often we're starting our lunches in a typical year at like around 10 a.m. and <laughs> um, ending around two. Um, so so I, I know we use those, those facilities pretty thoroughly when, when they are available to us 100%. Yeah, again, we're just start, starting to collect the hard data, but it looks like we would need the, um, the, the whole cafeteria and each, the gym in each school. I have one more so, question and it might better. Oh, sorry, Kimberly. No, I was just gonna clarify. So then, so then would we really need to get to 100% capacity for those spaces? Is that what you were saying, Donna? Or is yeah, it probably, conceivable? Yeah, probably not. Probably not. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I don't think we're aiming for the 100%, but certainly the 50% and the 75% will help us out. And I have one question, and it might probably be better served for when Dell speaks, but the one thing when we consider, you know, changing schedules for this year, as well as considering buildings for next year, is our special education population and the service delivery model for them in a multi-building approach. And I know Dell can probably speak better to this, but our special education teachers have been busting their butts having to deliver 100% of services in a hybrid model using a lot of that Wednesday time and other things, which requires and I'm not saying it's impossible, but it requires a completely re-overhaul of our schedule to make sure that their services are delivered. So perhaps we can speak a little bit about how that's gonna be impacted in these models as well, because there's some of our most, um, our population that has a lot of things that are required by law as well. Thank you, Jen. Yes, that is definitely one of the things, one of the many things that we would have to look at, um, you know, if we did some, some some changing is our special education services. And uh, of course, Dell is in on all our conversations uh, for his input on that, so. I have, I have another question too. In addition to, I know you're exploring a lot of options that are looking for more space or increasing space. Have you explored any options with scheduling um, to somehow stagger how spaces are used or, extending some of the, the time? Yeah, one of the things that we have talked about, we talked about it again today, was doing um, um, some kind of um, schedule where um, without getting into too many details because we aren't at the detail level yet, we're just sort of doing some brainstorming is, um, but doing uh, say a schedule where Pond Cove students maybe went from seven to one o'clock, seven in the morning to one o'clock, and then um, used both Pond Cove and the middle school, and then possibly middle school students went from 12 to five o'clock um, using Pond Cove in the middle school. So there would be um, a lot of details to work out, and we're just we're just really brainstorming options at this point, and. Um, those options will go to the committee and we'll talk about them and um, look at each one of them very carefully and um, talk about what's feasible, thinking about our three goals. Um, but we're, we're really open to, to looking and, and brainstorming about uh, solutions at this point. And that's one of the things that, you know, we. When I was in fifth grade, we did, it was called split sessions. So um, that would be an option um, that, we, that, we're, that we're certainly keeping on the table at this point. I think that's a great option uh, for us all to hear and for the community to hear. You know, everybody has been mentioning what creative strategies. So for us to just hear some, not every detail, and I understand that you're gonna work through the details with the committee. But to hear that, and that would, you know, it's not not a perfect fix, fix, but of course, but it would alleviate, you know, the parents having to essentially be the the homeschool teachers and all that stress uh, that 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 um, you know that they have to endure. So, looking forward to hearing what comes of that. Yeah, um, I just want to thank 
Jen for bringing up the special ed piece um, that can sometimes get forgotten. And in the conversations um, about private schools and what they're capable of doing, um, my understanding too, Donna, and this is just um, educating the public that um, private schools are not bound, or maybe this is for Dell, uh, by the same special ed laws. Um, and so their, um, their demands of uh, different services are, are not a complicating factor in getting students back into the classroom full time. Would that be an accurate statement? Dell, do you want to answer that? I could be wrong. I'm, I'm just looking for clarification here. Oh, we're putting you on the spot. Sorry. I'm sorry. Sure, Heather, you are absolutely correct. Uh, private schools are not required to provide special education services. Some may, uh, but they're right. not required to. Okay. Um, Donna, you're All right. Well, thank you for that. Uh, oh, Phil, did you have your hand raised? Um, sorry, it was not really a question, actually, just sort of next steps. Um, so, you know, as these details get fleshed out and we'll get, we're going to get questions and we should get questions from the community um, over the next weeks or so, just um, to circle back, um, you're going to announce a committee, we're going to announce a committee that is going to uh, be come together to work on these specifics. So some of the things we heard tonight that still need to be fleshed out, that's where it's going to be fleshed out. And then we'll be getting a recommendation at some, uh, at some point, hopefully right. sooner or later, but we'll get a recommendation that we'll then act upon. Okay. Correct. And then, and again, I hope that these will, while we're, while we're working, that people will be able to tune in and watch the work that's going on. Um, and uh, that we also will record the session so that people can go in and um, listen in on the conversation. And the work. Donna, have we have we clarified that we can do those meetings live? That we'll be doing them live. I, I don't. Know I, I, the think, I think I think we can. We haven't yeah. we haven't gotten the, we the haven't details. Gotten the definite on the technology, but I I don't see why we couldn't carry them on much as this meeting is. Right, and that's the goal. Live. That's the hope to bring it live and make it. Public. My hope. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. And perhaps okay. Yeah, that's great. Um, well, this was very helpful. Um, I appreciated this update. It was very thorough, Donna. It was um, informative to hear some of the many questions you're asking, some of them you're answering, some of them are still looming. But um, thank you for taking the time to educate the board and the public about the many hours you spend working. I think that we have to remember that things are, are always changing too. So as we're working on plans, things may change that totally um, derail the plan when we're almost finished working on it. So this is, you know, we went through this in the summer when we were working on plans and things were changing all, every day practically. So um, yeah, we'll, we'll continue our work. Thank you. So we're moving on to administrative um, reports and um, I'm just gonna make a small ask. Um, administrators, we do wanna hear what you have to say. I don't want to squash you at all. Um, but if you can go kind of quickly, it is 8.30. I know there are board members that have had long days as well and are tired and would like to be there with their family. That being said, we do want to hear what you're saying. So. Just be aware. I appreciate it. We're going to start with principals. Um, I'm going to start with Jason, our Punko principal, because I always go bottom up. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you, Heather, very much. And I hear your your request loud and clear. And I do, I'm going to cross out a few items. And um, but I, I do want to mention um, this something there's a lot of excitement around right now at Pond Cove. Uh, we have started the kindergarten registration process. And uh, we have already very quickly, we have 76 um, kindergartners um, who are uh, kindergarten parents who have started the registration process. And, and that's um, quite a few for this, for this time of year um, compared to previous years. So we're excited about that. Um, we have a new online registration system. And so the newly registering uh, kindergarten families are kind of really trying that out for the first time in the district. And it's working really well. And 
Um, I shouldn't thank people because I'm going to leave people out, but I know Andrea Fuller and Dean, and I believe that Kathy had a lot to do with this um, and probably many others. Um, so we're really pleased with the um, fully online registration process. Uh, it, again, just to kind of stick with the kindergarten theme, we are making plans right now to screen kindergartners in person. Um, in May, as usual, uh, we're working, I'm working with uh, the kindergarten team and with Nurse Taylor, uh, making sure that we do it safely. And we're excited about that too. So, um, and I, I think I'm just going to leave that as my celebration tonight. And just, but before I go, I just want to thank the Pond Cove staff, teaching staff, support staff, everyone for their just continuous um, commitment and dedication to the students. And I also want to thank the uh, family, parents and families for um, really valuable uh, feedback and um, also support that we've received um, throughout the last several months. So I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. I hope I didn't cut you off. I hope it was No, okay. I'm, I'm happy to not. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Uh, thank you. So next we have Troy Eastman which I don't, he was right here and now he's gone. So let's skip Troy for a moment. I don't see him, he'll probably pop back on and why don't we go to you, Jeff? Oh, hey, there's hey. Troy, there's Troy. Oops. You're back on, go ahead, okay. Troy. It took you serious, you said be short, so I was out. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Uh, yeah, so I didn't hear what Jason said, so hopefully I don't repeat anything, but I probably shouldn't since we work in different buildings. So. Um, honestly, there is a lot to talk about. We could go on and on and on, but um, I think it's really impressive. I mean, when I came to CAPE, it was because of an involved community, supportive community, and to see this many people in a Zoom tonight, I think just proves that and drives that point home. So we should celebrate that. Um, there is nothing but excitement as our teachers are getting vaccinated and rules are changing. And like, I just see so much opportunity ahead of us, I, I, I think we should be feeling nothing but positive at this point. Um, and then after what I would call a very long day, it was interesting. I, I mean, we have things going on that are amazing, hearing that state championships are still being won at the high school and life is still going on at some level in success. I think it's really, it's, health, it's healthy to hear that. Um, having the news at our place to celebrate, hey, it's a weird celebration, but it was a year today, <laughs> you know, or whatever recently. So when it all started, um, I have teachers that are going above and beyond every day throughout our building to make it happen. And, you know, our science team is now doing science labs in the library. Uh, that would have never happened before, but it's happening now because we need the space to do it. Um, and then today, after a long day of Zoom meetings, um, walking out, I had to do a double take and turn around and go back to the cafeteria. And it was so uplifting to hear our kids in there actually having band um, and hearing live instruments and just the amount of work it takes to have all that stuff happen. Um, it was, it's just really refreshing to walk through the halls and see, you know, kind of see smiling kids. They're clearly smiling, kids are happy. Um, so our goal is to get more kids in, but we definitely have a lot of rules and small pieces that I just think we have to manage and navigate. So um, we have the right people in place to do it. I truly appreciate the school board and your support. Um, and, and I just, I feel very lucky. There are a lot of schools that are not in the situations we are. Um, and we have the resources to, to really do a great job here. So thank you. And that's as quick as I can be. Uh, that is great. Thank you. And uh, shout out to Caitlin Ramsey, uh, the middle school band, band teacher who um, is making noise in the middle school with her students. Uh, Jeff Shedd, our high school principal. Okay, I'm gonna try to edit on the fly here. Um, so I, I had a hope, I had a report planned about um, what we are doing on a, about an issue that we all do share and refer to tonight, which is- which I don't is, want you to cut it back too much, Jeff. If, if there's uh, a stuff. I'm gonna highlight a few things and that'll be okay. fine. So it's really about mental health concerns. Um, and I mean, I could go on and on about the work that the staff is doing, but I'll, I'll just say a few things, just to highlight a few things. One is, I think it's, it has been really helpful, and I think this, this board meeting has illustrated it, the value of having students be able to participate in extracurricular activities, including sports. Um, that has made a, a big difference, I think, for many kids who are involved. Um, um, and tonight, 
For example, I know that the, the one act is in one of its last rehearsals for, the, for preparing their theater performance the one, for the one act festival. So there are many things that are going on and kids are very involved. All of the things are different. They're all do, looking differently, but um, and be having to be done within guidelines, but they're going forward and that's really helpful. I also did want to highlight that we have brought back over the last month or two, we have brought back um, somewhere between, I don't know the exact number, um, uh, somewhere between a dozen and 20 students who are back uh, in the high school physically four days a week uh, because the, the hybrid learning was particularly not working well for them. Um, and so I wanted to mention that. Um, I wanted to mention the fact just to make sure the community is aware that our students are because our students are older and our teachers have the opportunity to work with older students, our students are actually attending school four days a week. They're not four days a week in person, they're, but they're four days a week uh, with live instruction with teachers. And I think that has helped us with some issues that I won't go into right now. And then I just wanted to share a few highlights. I um, grabbed Joyce Nato, who's one of our social workers in school at the end of the day and just said, Joyce, tell me what you're noticing. Are there any trends? And and, and she said to make sure that the board knows that the things she reported to me are not the base of any statistical analysis, any data analysis, any collection. They're based on her anecdotal sort of impressions this year, um, being grabbed five minutes before she leaves school. Um, so take it with a grain of salt. So um, she said, uh, without any question, that more is falling on families uh, to provide for interaction, live interaction time with students. Um, and that, and Sometimes she said that some parents have the impression that if students are gaming online, that they are interacting and in a sense they are, but it's not the live interaction that they really need um, around dinner time with their families and that sort of thing. So if a family is fortunate enough to be able to provide those live interactions and some are not, she said that is so important. She said that sports has been a tremendous help once that uh, kicked in with students who are active in sports. She said something interesting, which I never would have thought of, is that students who um, have always participate, had a strong outdoor life and outside life. Um, and she mentioned kids who were involved in either skiing or skating or fishing or just hiking or things like that. Uh, her impression is are actually managing much better um, with a lot of things because they've got that. She did say, and these are still small numbers and small percentage of students, but um, she said that in the, for the number of kids that she's seeing, she has seen an uptick in the number of kids uh, who are demonstrating signs of OCD, of obsessive compulsive disorder. And she spec has speculated that one of the reasons for that is one of the things that we ask kids to do 10 times, 15 times a day is to wash their hands, sanitize their hands. Um, and sometimes, which is healthy up to, a, absolutely healthy up to a point and it needs to be there. But for some kids, if it's uh, internalized too much, it can be, it can become uh, a challenge as well. And she said the same thing is true. She's noticed a number of students who have a fear of illness, understandably, um, that is healthy up to a point again, but can reach can reach a, an unhealthy level at the same time. Um, she has also noticed, um, and I think it's, and she traces it back to and understands again. This is all speculation. It's not database. It's not just impressions that there are more students who are, who are struggling with eating issues um, than is true in a typical school year. And she wonders whether or not that's in part because it is challenging to eat in school. Um, uh, the snack breaks are possible. Um, water breaks are possible within limits, but most kids are handling it by essentially, I think drinking a whole lot less and eating a whole lot less. And she is concerned about that and has seen some effects of that. She also said, she also made a plea to parents to the extent that they feel that they can to be able to continue with rituals that are important for kids who are growing up. And the one she mentioned in particular is driver's education. If parents are, are comfortable having kids do driver's education with open windows, uh, that it is such a big milestone for students um, that some of those, those rituals that we all take for granted are taken away from kids. And she did mention that our senior class especially has been hit hard with the loss of rituals, which is why we're trying to make some opportunity available for student senior transition project um, and working closely with the junior and senior class leaders around a senior night 
I do still have a hard time understanding how a prom at three foot or six foot distancing is going to take place. Uh, and I don't think even as capacity increases change that that three, the three foot or six, six foot distancing is going to change. Um, so I think the senior night is a more, more uh, likely scenario that can, that can really, I think, help our kids have a fun end of the year as much as we can provide it to them. Thank you very much, that's it. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, Marcy Weeks, our business manager. Hi, everyone. For the monthly financial report, the percentage of the year occurred as of February 28th was 67% of the year. So that was the forecast target. The total general fund expenditures were 60% as of February 28th. The average percentage spent at this time for the past five years was 63%. So we were within three points of below the average at that time. The mean average for the forecasting trend this year has been a four point range, which means that um, at this point, the range between the actual and the forecast was the seven points I mentioned, but there will be some um, now events that will be occurring that will close this gap in the next few months related to substitutes, our need and expense for substitutes, unless we can get help from grants. So that's what we're keeping our eye on the most at this point. Uh, moving forward, also our debt service payments will be due. And at last year at this point, we were exactly at the same percentage point for debt service, which was 8%, which means we will be paying 100% of our debt service in the next few months, closing that gap even more. And I'll keep it short at that, Heather. That sounds like really good news. Thanks. Welcome. Kathy Stanker, our Director of Teaching and Learning. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, I have hot off the press updates about this spring's main educational assessment. The state has contracted with New Meridian to develop the science assessments for students in grades five, eight, and 11. The good news for us is that these assessments will be aligned to the next generation science standards, which are the basis for our course learning target. So there'll be alignment between what we teach um, and how the state is assessing our students. And these assessments will take place the last two weeks in May. And then in other news, the state has contracted with NWEA to provide its map growth, the name of the assessment, um, in reading language uses language usage and math um, to students in grades three through eight and 11. And again, really good news here for us in that we already administer the map growth assessment to students in grades one through eight. Um, so that means that only our high school teachers will need training um, like other districts where they're gonna have to um, train all of their teachers. Um, and um, the state is going to reimburse us for the uh, cost that we spent purchasing NWA this year. I know I've mentioned this before, so we anticipate getting a check of about $10,000 um, for FY21. And that testing window actually started March 1st, which is kind of funny since they didn't announce the contract officially until today. Um, but, and it runs uh, through, the testing window runs through June 15th. We anticipate administering the assessments in late May so that we can maximize instructional growth um, that instructional growth period from the fall. That's it. Thank you, Kathy. Can you guys hear me? Mm -hmm. no. Oh, okay, good. Sorry, my computer just said it had changed. So a little glitch there. Um, we have Dell, our director of special services. Welcome, thanks for being patient. Thank you, Heather. Um, I also want to thank Jen for mentioning how hard the special education staff has been working all year long to provide services individuals need to meet the individual needs of our students. Um, I appreciate the mention. I could not be uh, prouder of the staff and how hard they've worked and what they've accomplished this year in a completely uh, new format. Um, I just I, I was gonna, I didn't have a whole lot for you. I wanted to just go over the numbers that, of with regard to students that are we're servicing at this time. We have 170 students that receive special education services. 
we have one student that's outplaced and we have 12 students that are currently in the referral process. Thank you. Dale, do you know what, um, what percentage of students, do you know the percentage of students that receive special services in our district or is that? Yes, um, we are um, hovering just under 11%. And the district, uh, no, the state average is um, 18, I want to say 18, it's, it's over 18%. And I, I don't know the exact number off the top of my head. Okay. That number, of course, keeps ticking up. And um, the, uh, the, the goal the state looks at is the 15%. And that has to do with the EPS funding formula. So we receive a particular amount of funds up until the 15th percent. And when you go over that, you receive a reduced number uh, amount per student. So the 15 percent is like a built-in um, uh, limiting factor, if you may, uh, that the state has uh, put in to encourage districts to uh, stay at a certain level, um, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense because it doesn't align with what we're required to do, but CAPE is doing really well at uh, just under 11%. And servicing a lot of students well is what it sounds like to me. So thank you so much. Donna, the superintendent report. I just want to touch base really quickly on our ventilation project. Um, we have used our are a large chunk of our COVID relief fund, uh, well over 600,000 now for our ventilation projects um, so that we can safely get, get all of our students back in our classrooms. Our um, uh, capacities were uh, severely cut um, when we went into COVID um, based on our needs assessment report. So now we're, we're updating the ventilation projects and the Pond Cove and Middle School has, they've been completed without us having to miss any school or switch to remote, which we thought we were going to have to do. So that is good news. And um, they will be, uh, the project will be continuing at the high school um, through the April break. And hopefully right after the April break, it will be completed so that our high school will um, also have the updated ventilation. So that, um, that is good news. And um, our high school principal search committee process is nearing an end and we hope to have a name to bring forward to the board in the very near future. So we've had a very active committee that's worked very hard and it's hard to think about not having Jeff here. So they've been, in, they've been grieving at the same time as working, so. Thanks, Donna, and I am fully aware of how much um, time that takes to do a very thorough process to fill a very um, important position in our district. So to everybody who is involved in those interviews in that process, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to participate. The committee's done a great job. But I've been hearing and I, I'm, I'm grateful. Um, so moving on, May I have a motion, please, for new business, please? I'll make a motion for new business. Um, so can you read item A? Do you have it in front of you, the agenda? It's all good, Jen. I do. Um, considerations to approve Colby Company, Scott Simon Architects as architects for the concept design of Pond Cove Elementary in Cape Elizabeth Middle School. I have a second. Second. Is that Laura? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, any comments or questions? Um, Donna, do you wanna to speak to this? Do you want me to we speak put, to it? Yeah, we put out a request for qualifications and we got nine um, packets back um, that the members of the committee reviewed and we selected five to interview. So we held um, quite extensive interviews and, um, and brought, uh, Colby back for uh, a final interview. We had, there were some other questions that we had um, and um, so we're recommending Colby Company. Yeah, 
I was part of the interviews as well. I'd like to just add, I know um, Marcy was there. Um, and um, I just like to reiterate uh, for the public what Donna said, we, you know, this is a big hire. This is a important um, role um, in our community in the next um, foreseeable future uh, because they will be helping us interact with the community and explain a lot of questions as we head towards a bond and um, we did feel confident about Colby and Company and we wanted to make sure that that was not just because we had a relationship with them um, and we wanted to to ask some follow-up questions and they really proved their worth to us that um, you know it, it was a very I think a straightforward dis decision to go with them on our behalf and I fully support it. And uh, thanks to Marcy for organizing the interviews. And yes, she did a fabulous our, our job. Interviews and, yes. <laughs> Are there any questions from the board before we do vote on this? No, I would just comment also that I think, um, I think we interviewed um, some great firms. Um, I think we were, we were very fortunate to have so many and I think that um, that it was really nice to, to have um, some good serious contenders, um, which to me just uh, um, made Colby and uh, Scott and Simon um, rise that much more to the top. Thanks for that, Kimberly. Okay, so Heather Altmerg is a yay. Kimberly Carr. <clears throat> Phil had a comment. Oh, I'm sorry, Phil, I missed you before we vote. I take away yeah, my- Yeah, I, I, you know this, but I have to publicly disclose why I'm gonna abstain and it's only simply because um, uh, it came to my attention after I did participate in the first round of interviews, but I was not involved in any selection or recommendation, but it came to my attention that one or more of the finalists have a, have a relationship with my law firm. And so I'm just gonna abstain to avoid any potential conflict of interest. Thank you, Phil. Going back to the vote, I'll start again. Heather Altenberg is a yay. Kimberly Carr. Yay. Uh, Phil is abstaining. Uh, Elizabeth Seifries. Yay. Cindy Bolts. Yay. Jen McVeigh. Yay. And Laura Danino. Yay. May I have a motion for item 8B? I move we approve a resolution or response regarding teacher vaccinations. May I have a second? Second. Okay. So I'm trying to look up an email, which I was, should have done this ahead of time. Um, this is, um, this was come to, brought to our attention by Superintendent Wolfram, by Donna, that um, many uh, school boards were advocating for vaccines for their teachers. And so we have put together a resolution for just that to um, ask the state to consider moving vaccinations for teachers, uh, prioritize them. Um, and um, that's happening. So um, we have decided to, um, we don't need to advocate for that. So. We were contemplating writing uh, a thank you email, but adding a little bit more to it. So Phil, we you had sent me a possible wording that I was hoping to have right at the fingertips and I can't- I, can, I have it right here if you want me to That's suggest great. it. Um, so thanks. Um, I was just thinking through I, you know, uh, where we didn't necessarily need to vote on the same motion or letter because the, the, the vaccinations changed that we should at a minimum and Heather, I think suggested this maybe writing a letter thanking the governor for, for adding teachers, but at the same time, maybe suggesting uh, adding something in there about the, um, what we've heard tonight, essentially, um, about the reopening um, got, uh, requirements. Mindful, and I'm very mindful of this, understanding that it's, it's, it's an impediment, but I also want to be, uh, I wouldn't want them to change if they're not safe to change. So I didn't want to go too far with what we're going to say. But, but what I said, this is something I suggested, um, and we can always maybe tweak it afterwards if people want to go in this direction. So I don't think people need to, you need to agree to this language necessarily with this motion tonight, but maybe a motion to go in this direction. I'll just read, it's very short. So after thanking the governor for the vaccination, I was thinking about something like this. We would also like to thank you for your leadership and 
helping keeping our students, staff, and teachers safe and your policy and that your policies have allowed for in-person le hybrid learning. Um, in-person learning through a hybrid approach this year. As vaccination rates increase and COVID cases decrease, we know that we all share the goal of returning to a full-time five days a week in-person learning, which is vital for our students' educational success and mental health. While we have been constrained from offering additional in-person learning by the Maine Department of Education, six requirements for safely opening schools, we look forward to working with you to find a solution to return to full, full in-person classroom instruction as soon as possible. Something like that. So I would like, thank you, Phil, uh, for having that at your fingertips and easy access. Um, I would like to reiterate that I don't think we need to take the time right now to wordsmith this. Um, I think this is more of a discussion of is the board comfortable with, uh, as a board chair, uh, to send something along those lines to the state. Um, and so our wording for the motion is a response um, regarding teacher vaccinations. Um, so that means, I don't know if we need to vote on this. Can board members or Donna help me? Do we want to amend the, the motion here and vote on writing to... Um, well, I think the response, it's the response it regarding the response. So I think that would be a response. Okay. I think so we, a, a vote would be fine on that. So we're, we would be voting on um, sort of allowing myself to write a letter to the state on behalf along the lines of what Phil spoke to. I'd just like to hop in and say, I would like to be careful that it's not just teacher vaccinations, but all school staff, because it's ed techs, it's bus drivers, it's, it's everybody. And I just wanna make sure that we make that clear, not just tonight to the public, but to the governor that, I mean, we recognize that it takes everybody. And um, that I feel like this advocacy is, is really appropriate and um, can, hopefully help us get a better sense of where we're going because I think it's always been signaled and not, not ever stated, but it's signaled. And I, I even read from a, a, an epidemiologist friend today that as more um, educators get, to a, a get vaccinated as, as that threshold of immunity within that group grows, then the, the chances that the DOE will relax the guidelines increase so it, it can only help so I mean and, and I agree with Bill because we don't necessarily want these proven safe mitigation strategies to go away until they should go away so I, I think this is an appropriate way to approach it that um, you know as they see these you know if they reach this threshold for educators that they then can relax these guidelines that would be fantastic for us and for all students. Agreed. I like that last sentence. If we reach the threshold for educators, then the guidelines would be relaxed for students. So I know we don't, I'm not advocating for wordsmithing tonight by no means, but um, yes, we, I think we can vote on this and that sounds good. Thanks Phil for putting that together and reading it. Okay. It looks like we're ready to vote. I'm not seeing any hands raised. So um, before we do vote, I just want to say thanks again to Phil for putting that together. Um, Heather Altenberg is a yay. Kimberly Carr. Yay. Phil Saucier. Yay. Elizabeth Seifries. Yay. Cindy Bolts. Yay. Jen McVeigh. Yay. And Laura Danino. Yay. Okay, may I have a motion for item 8C? I move we approve the co-curricular job description peer mentor. Second. That's great. Oh. I've lost it on my... Okay, my... Um... Sorry, my agenda in front of me doesn't have any more on it. 
I've got it all. Nope, that's it. So, okay. so it's go just ahead. Yep. Um, so I guess, Donna, do you want to talk about this? I go from item C to item J. That's what I'm concerned about right now. So I'm oh. missing something. So that's why it threw me. So I'm going to look up the agenda on my phone. Donna, can you speak to this um, to the this action item? To the peer mentor job yeah. description? Um, so I'm going to pass this off to Kathy because okay, Kathy great. worked on the, um, the job description. Okay. Yes. So the state requires us to provide a mentor to all new educators. Um, and um, that requirement replaces a prior requirement where we had to, to provide a mentor to all educators who were not yet professionally certified. Um, and so, uh, so really what we're doing here is replacing an old job description with a new dis job description. Um, the responsibilities are essentially the same, but we did throw in a few things from that district mentor position that we had created um, for the one year that the old certification mentor job description was still in place. So you have actually approved um, educators to serve as peer mentors, and um, we just neglected to bring the job description forward um, earlier in the year. So, hence now. Thanks for that clarification. Are there any other questions from the board? I think it's really important to sort of dot our I's and cross our T's, and so thank you for following through and bringing this to us. Um, voting Heather Altenberg is a yay. Kimberly Carr. Yay. Phil Saucier. Yay. Elizabeth Seyfries. Yay. Cindy Volts. Yay. Jen McVeigh. Yay. And Laura Danino. Yay. Okay. Thank goodness for multiple media. My agenda is now here. Uh, may I have a motion for item D, 8D? I move we approve the 2021-2022 Cape Elizabeth High School Program of Studies. I have a second. I second. Thank you, Kimberly. And Jeff has already spoken to us um, about some of the small, not small, but some of the changes from last year. Um, so we've already sort of had this discussion about this, um, but does anybody else have questions? Jeff, do you have anything you'd like to add um, on top of what you said last time or are you? The last time I think I highlighted the few changes that yeah. are in the program of studies and unless there are questions, I don't know that I need to take the board's time for doing that again. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Heather Altenberg is a yay. Kimberly Carr. Yay. Phil Saucier? Yay. Elizabeth Seyfries? Yay. Cindy Volts? Yay. Jen McVeigh? Yay. And Laura Danino? Yay. May I have a motion, item 8E? I move we approve a one-year leave of absence, Laura Briggs. Second. I have a second. Elizabeth Seyfries, thank you. Um, and so just as a reminder for the public, there will be no discussion um, on this action item due to the fact that it is personnel. Um, so we will move right into voting. Um, Heather Altenberg is a yay. Kimberly Carr. Yay. Phil Saucier. Yay. Elizabeth Seyfries. Yay. Cindy Volts. Yay. Jen McVeigh. Yay. And Laura Danino. Yay. Consider, may I have a motion? Hi, move we approve the following athletic nominations as defined in our packet. May I have a second? Second. Second. 
Um, again, as I often do, I just like to reach out and say thank you to those who are stepping into these positions as it's been outlined in so many ways by so many parents. Um, these extracurricular activities um, are important um, and they play a vital role and they don't happen without people stepping into these um, jobs. So thank you for all you do. Are there any other comments? Okay, Heather Altmer is a yay. Kimberly Carr. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't get it to unmute. Um, yay. <laughs> Phil Saucier. Yay. Elizabeth Seifries. Yay. Cindy Volts. Yay. Jen McVeigh. Yay. And Laura Danino. Yay. May I have a motion for item 8G? I guess I have a quick question because in the past we've had to read at least part of the uh, lease purchase agreement. So I wanted to ask Marcy if we have to do that. Our bond council um, reviewed it for us, Elizabeth, and, and the proposal from Andrew Scoggin. And he provided the, um, the sheet for your reference. So all you have to do is read the statement, that one liner statement. Um, that's on the agenda yeah, or that's on the agenda I believe okay. yes correct then, that's what he then said. I'm willing to make that motion I wasn't willing to read <laughs> yes that's what he okay. said was appropriate <laughs> great I move we approve uh the school bus lease financing with Andrew Scoggin Bank in the form presented to the board I have a second second Marcy are you able to speak yes. to this a little bit thank you yes um, we were delayed. Usually we do this process in the fall, but we were delayed with this, um, with the, the COVID grant process and the bus that we purchased with the grant funding first. We had a timeline with that, that we pushed to get the bus at the time by December 30th, which pushed us behind in this lease purchase. And we've made the decision that since it was um, so far in the year that we are doing the lease purchase for the bus, for a three-year lease, um, Andrew Scoggin Bank was the lowest bidder. And now we are able to eliminate for next year in the budget of the purchase of a new, but, a new bus at this time. So it saved the money for the next fiscal year by pushing it towards the end at this time. So um, yes, yeah, so it's basically getting back on target with our three-year rotation with lease purchase and Andrew Scoggin, again, was the lowest, lowest bid for the interest rate. That sounds good. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Okay, clearly needing glasses right now. Um, so for vote, Heather Altenberg is yay. Kimberly Carr? Yay. Phil Saucier? Yay. Elizabeth Seifries? Yay. Cindy Bolts? Yay. Jen McVeigh? Yay. And Laura Danino? Yay. Uh, Marcy, thank you for the work you've done on that. Really appreciate it. You're welcome. And then again, I like your frugalness. <laughs> May I have a motion, please? I move we revise our FY22 school board budget goals. May I have a second? I second. Um, Elizabeth, would you be willing to speak to this? Thanks. So at our um, last budget workshop, um, it became clear that the board might want to consider um, updating its budget goals to include a priority around um, returning to full-time in-person learning because um, the board really has just a few functions. Um, we really don't have the power that many people think we have. Um, we, we budget, we set goals, and we set policy, and we evaluate the superintendent. There's really, there's a whole, not a whole lot more to it, and there's a heck of a lot of committees. So in thinking about how we can um, support the return to um, full-time in-person learning, especially in the 2021-2022 school year, there, there needs to be some sort of discussion of budget because everything is attached to money. Um, so that's how it wound up on the agenda. And um, 
like Phil, I like to think ahead of time and wordsmith a little bit. So um, I suggest that we add a budget goal that says um, prioritize the return to full time in person learning and support post pandemic academic and social emotional needs of all students. And we add that into our list of budget goals. And if people like the wording, I'll share it with Heather and the board. And if you don't, then come up with your own words. <laughs> Are there any uh, <laughs> questions or comments? Sorry, it's getting late. I'm getting- I know. <laughs> Thank so you, ready Elizabeth. To go. Ready to I, go. I think it sounds great. I like it. Yes. I like it too. <laughs> Could I just clarify, Elizabeth, was that going to be a fifth budget goal for us or, or are, we, are we taking something out? Did you envision? I envision just adding it and I, um, I would suggest making it number four um, because I like, the, I like ending with the careful examination of line items and consideration of the success and effectiveness of the expenditures in order to provide a fiscally responsible budget to be sort of the end statement, if if you really want to know. <laughs> yep, I I concur. I like that. Thank you. It looks like the board is. Um, thanks for that clarification, Elizabeth and Kimberly. Uh, ready to vote. Heather Altenberg's a yay, and thank you, Elizabeth, for wordsmithing. Kimberly Carr, yay. Phil Saucier. Yay. Elizabeth Seyfries. Yay. Cindy Boltz. Yay. Jen McVeigh. Yay. And Laura Danino. Yay. Elizabeth, you are up again. May I have a motion for item 8i? So I move we approve policy IMB teaching about controversial issues. May I have a second? Second. Thank you. All right, so briefly, this is a second reading. The policy is teaching about controversial issues. Um, the, the policy committee did not receive any comment for um, change from the first read. It really um, just gives a little structure around um, how controversial issues should be defined. Um, and how like the, the appropriateness of discussion should really be thought about around um, age appropriate, grade appropriate, maturity of students, that sort of thing. Um, and it needs to be thought about in student rights. Um, we looked at um, a Drummond and Woodson sample, we looked at an MSMA sample, and in the end we um, used more from um, our own and um, I believe we took a little from Drummond and Woodson. We took when we took some from MSMA, and um, that's where we wound up. It's not different from the last time you saw it at the last board meeting. Right. Are there any questions or comments? Um, I feel like this is an important policy. I feel like um, it becomes more and more important as the years go on. Um, and I'm glad we looked at it. And uh, for future policy chairs, I think it should be revisited again sooner rather than later. I, I think this is one of those policies, again, in a couple of years, you know, not wait 10 years out, I think is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Because I think this is gonna continue to be one of those policies that um, will be referred to over the years. I think year. so too. I mean, it, it really is about you know, training students in reflective and responsive thinking and critical thinking skills and that sort of thing. Yeah. But I think the way that um, teachers handle it is important, so. Absolutely. Yep. Heather Altenberg is a yay. Kimberly Carr. Yay. Phil Saucier. Yay. Elizabeth Seyfries. Yay. Cindy Volz. Yay. Jen McVeigh. Yay. And Laura Danino. Yay. May I have a motion, item 8J. I move we approve policy IMBB, accommodation of sincere beliefs in required instruction. May I have a second? Second. 
Elizabeth. So again, this is a policy that's brought back to the board for a second reading. Um, it, it had no changes in between. We heard nothing um, at the policy level from anybody for changes at, uh, up to this policy. Um, it really just recognizes that there could be topics in the curriculum that may be objectionable to individual students based on their sincerely held religious or moral or philosophical beliefs and um, that accommodations can be made. And that's usually within um, conversation with the building principals and teachers. Um, we really just revisited it because there's a cross reference from the prior policy. So that's where we're at. That's what I was gonna say. It, it goes hand in hand, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's sister policy. So yep. um, any questions? Okay, Heather Altmer, yay. Kimberly Carr. Yay. Phil Saucier. Yay. Elizabeth Seifries. Yay. Cindy Volts. Yay. Jan McVeigh. Yay. And Laura Danino. Yay. That's great. I um I just want to take a moment and and say something about policy is that um I mentioned this before, but about another topic, but I think policy is a is a structure that that we refer to a lot as a board and as an administration and as a district. It sort of governs um, some of the choices that or the choices that we make and how how we can um, move forward. And it's a lot of this revisiting is dotting our I's and crossing our T and just creating more uh, clarity and um, consistency across the district. So um, I just want to thank Elizabeth for being the chair of this, leading this policy committee. Um, and I know Kathy, you participate quite a bit as well and help with this. So thank you for all that you do. Might not be exciting work, but it is super important. So um, another motion item 8K, please. I move that we eliminate policy KLF community services programs. I have a second. second. I second. Okay, I heard Kimberly Carr. Thank you. Um, Elizabeth. So um, this is just a holdover from a long time ago. Um, I really don't know why it's still in the policy manual. It talks about um, different rules and regulations regarding uh, the board oversight of community services. As long as I've been on the board, the board does, did not have oversight of community services. So, um, and I actually believe I was in policy committee years ago where we voted to delete this and maybe it just didn't make it out of the manual. So, um, but to be clear to the public, the, um, the school department does not have any oversight or um, anything to do with ruling or regulating community services. So this policy needs to come out of our manual. Seems pretty straightforward to me. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Heather Altenberg is a yay. Kimberly Carr. Yay. Phil Saucier. Yay. Elizabeth Seifries. Yay. Cindy Volts. Yay. Jen McVeigh. Yay. And Laura Danino. Yay. And finally, Elizabeth, first reading of policy DJF. We've been busy in policy committee. Um, policy DJF was brought to us by our school nutrition director, Peter Esposito, um, specifically around his needs um, for this policy to be established in order for him to get certain grant funding. And I don't know if Peter or Donna want to speak to this a little bit more, but it's um, it, it doesn't change any of our um, policies or requirements that are already or procedures that are happening. It just um, a lot of these, um, I don't know if it's many granting organizations or just one that require that the policy exists. So I'll, I'll turn it over to Donna if there's- you know, I don't know if Peter's still on. Peter, are you still here? No. Um, so this was a policy as Elizabeth said that Peter requested. We do have a procurement um, policy 
um, that um, covers other things, but we, uh, Peter did need, in order to participate in the um, purchasing with uh, organizations such as GSEA, which is our regional organization, um, he, we needed to have this policy. So he has looked at it. We, we did a little work on it and he has looked at it again to make sure that it um, meets the needs of, of what he needs. And um, he did say that it, it looked fine to him, so. And since it's a first reading, no vote is required, but anybody that wants to give comment, um, shoot those comments or question my way before the next policy committee meeting at the end of the month. Thank you. Um, just for logistical purposes, Elizabeth, you were in front of me. I just made you host. I'm on my husband's computer. It's saying that it could shut down at any moment because of the power and we don't have the power cord here. So I may disappear. And if I was the host, the whole meeting would end. So I quickly made you host in case I disappear. <laughs> and then the meeting can continue. Um, and I'll pop on on my phone. So look for me and let me back in, please, if that happens. <laughs> um, so are there any school board agenda requests? Um, Heather, I would, um, I, I guess I feel a little torn about this. I hate to have the social workers um, and, um, you know, anyone offering social and emotional support to our students um, pulled away from um, supporting our students. But um, I think we had a great um, update report on the um, academics of our students. And I think it would be nice to have a report on um, what, what we're seeing in the schools as far as social and emotional concerns and how um, those are being addressed. Kimberly, I think that's um, an excellent point and um, I think a very worthy topic uh, for us and for the town to hear. Um, so thank you for bringing that up. I see Donna nodding her head. Um, in agreement, so thank you. Uh, committee reports, I'll have to say, um, I missed the past meeting um, and I was intentionally hoping to go back and watch it, but I never did. Donna, do you have any, I, I'm putting you on the spot, I can. Um, it was a very short meeting again. Okay. Um, they are in the process now of <clears throat> um, doing uh, virtual visitations uh, for, for sign up for enrollment. Um, so that was really about all they said. Um, they talked a little bit about, um, about those visitations. Um, they feel that um, enrollment is down in as far as the visitations go, the number of, of students participating in the visitations and um, although some students really like the, uh, uh, the virtual process. So uh, mostly it was talking about that and there were no presentations from any of the, which is what's nice in person because frequently they'll have students come and do presentations about the various departments and they have not done that. So that's about it. <laughs> On a quick question, although the um, in attendance was low, are the applications still high? for students that want to participate in the PASS program? Um, I, they were just, they are just doing the, um, the virtual visits now. So I don't, I don't believe that uh, the applications are coming in yet. I can check on that, but I think they're just in the um, visitation process now. Thank you for clarifying. Thanks for having my back. Um, Elizabeth, do you have any more to share on policy? I do not. I'll jump ahead so I don't have to speak again about this, that the policy committee meets on March 29th at 3 p.m. at the end of this month. Okay, it's that's great. Public meeting and it's uh, Zoom. Thank you for that. Um, I'm reporting on DEI, which continues to meet bi-weekly. Um, and there continues to be amazing professional development um, within the district that is around the DEI work most recently um, on the Wa Wabanakis um, and really educational and powerful about um, the history there. Um, so thank you, Kathy, for, for organizing that. And 
correct me if I'm wrong, but part of the district, a half of the district participated once and they, the other half will be participating at another time because there was a spacing limitation, correct? Okay, that's great. Um, however, in the actual uh, committee, some of the conversations, um, they're very rich. We have um, had a woman who is a professor, um, I would say almost self-taught about racism, Kate Slater. She is, um, I really liked her. Um, I thought she was effective and powerful. Um, she is Jonna Dewayne, who is our high school ceramic teacher, old high school friend, which is how we connected with her. Um, and she just had some really good conversation with all of us and there is the potential to reach out and do more work with her. I think um, she resonated with a lot of people on the committee. Um, one of the things she was talking about was an equity audit, which was a sort of a new term for me. Um, and it's just a way to look at our district and what are our practices and building um, social justice as a bedrock. Um, and so those are some of the conversations. Um, I don't know, Kathy, if you have more to say or if that sort of sums that up, okay. Um, and then um, the other thing that we are having a conversation is about is that there are some people that are um, having the, the difficult conversations about facing racism and facing our own white privilege and um, realizations of what that means and some wanna act. Um, Kate was talking about an action plan of how she has made certain decisions this year. For example, um, going to a black owned bank um, to support black owned. Um, that is one of her action steps for the year. And so um, some of the teachers, it's a little bit divided right now. And so we're in the middle of the discussion. Some teachers are asking for action steps and support in moving forward. And other teachers are saying, this is such a big, um, issue and conversation that um, we are like this far into the education and learning of it. And uh, really we need to keep diving into it and keep sitting into the discomfort and not rush to fix things or move forward as experts without um, further information and knowledge is what I'm taking out of this. And I'm seeing Kathy's head shaking. So I think she's in agreement with me. But I continue to think that the work is um, really incredible and very necessary. Um, Superintendent search committee. I have Heather down, but I believe Elizabeth and I, we talked and you were gonna do it. So to update the public at this point, um, our application for um, superintendent has been live and advertising along um, national uh, print and online media has been live since um, it's been over three weeks. Applications actually close at the end of this week. Uh, the board has organized multiple um, information gathering sessions from um, all the stakeholders. We've had listening sessions with the administrative team the each each staff at each school and um, we put out a, a parent community member survey. The board also met and kind of did its own kind of prioritization work. So um, at this point we are gathering um, that information and we'll be kind of sifting through looking for um, common themes that that pop out from all of the stakeholders in the community. Um, the interview committee has come together. Um, I will post every single name on the um, superintendent search website. They're not, um, because there's one name that I don't remember, I don't wanna say all the names. And it's, uh, so I just, I, I know I can see this person's face and it's, it's a teacher and I value her and I don't wanna, I'm not gonna say everybody's names. Um, what I will say is that we have um, two parents and I will say their names because we had a fantastic response to the board's call for participation. And it, it's really gratifying to see how many people are willing to do this work. Um, so we have Gina Tapp and Pavel Darling who are um, joining school staff and um, board members in this work. It's really exciting. But for the full list of administrators 
and um, teachers and um, board members and uh, parents, please go to the superintendent search website. I will frantically email Jen Lackery tomorrow morning with the full list and ask her to post that right away. Um, that, in, that full team um, had a training with Eileen King from MSMA on um, legal hiring practices, which was really good. And um, next steps, we will start um, to be able to review applications after they close. And um, at that point, um, start seeing who rises to the top for interviews. And we will start working on interview questions and um, set up first interviews um, later on in the month. So that's where we're at right now. Thanks, Elizabeth. Yeah. And thanks yes. for letting Heather, me Yeah. I have one other quick committee update from the technology committee. Looks like we missed oh, it. Oh, yeah. Uh, so I was so to put that in there. Um, the, the technology committee met for the first time in February. It's a, it's a committee that has been, it's existed primarily in name only for the last several years. So the committee met for the first time. We had um, the technology integrators and technology teachers from each school, as well as Donna and Kathy. Um, and the first meeting was really just sort of um, brainstorming about what we wanted the committee to be and what the scope of the committee could be. And I think we'll continue to do that work over the next several months. Um, and then we also spent um, about half of the meeting working on the job description for the new um, direct educational technology director. Is that the final title, I think, okay. Kathy? Director, Director of Educational Technology. Director of Educational Technology uh, job description. So um, it, it was a, a great meeting and lots of, uh, I think, incitement and enthusiasm about what, what we'll be able to do with that committee. And the next meeting is March 24th. At 1230, is that correct? At 1230. And that is a public meeting by Zoom. Cindy, thank you for providing this. Um, I know you're bringing your passion to it. So thanks so much. Um, and in my technology snafu, I just want everybody to know I can only see four people at a time. So if you need to speak up like Cindy did, I appreciate that. Um, at this point though, there shouldn't be much left. We are just announcing upcoming meetings. The next DEI task force is March 10th at 3.30. PAS is March 18th at 8.30. Uh, we have our budget workshop. Um, coming up our next school board budget workshop on March 23rd at 6.30. Uh, technology committee again, March 24th at 1230 policy, uh, March 29th at three. And then um, the subfinance committee, which um, continues to thrive and help, um, help bridge the communication between the town and the school board. Um, with the town manager and finance chair and likewise on the school board and the chair of the fi uh, the finance chair and chair of the town council as well as Phil and myself. So um, those are very uh, beneficial and helpful for us to have. Uh, that will take place March 23rd at 8.30 in the morning. The next DEI task force is um, March 31st, that's not correct. Is that Kathy? We have one tomorrow, I believe. Tomorrow. Yeah, there's one tomorrow. At tomorrow and then and then on the 31st as well, I think. Right. I think Jen was just being very efficient. Yeah, thanks for that clarification. So moving to the final agenda item before we do, I know this has been a long and late and um, at times perhaps emotional. Um, so thank you everybody for sticking it out. And uh, may I have in a motion? I move we adjourn. Thank you, Laura. Second. Second. I didn't hear that. And I know Jen Lackery is gonna ask me who it was. <laughs> it was Cindy. It was Cindy. Thank you, Cindy. Uh, Heather Altenberg, yay. Kimberly Carr. Yay. Cossier. Yay. Elizabeth Seifries. Yay. Cindy Boltz. Yay. Dan McVeigh. Yay. Laura Danino. Yay. 
I hope you all have a great night, sleep well. Um, and thank you so much. Elizabeth, all right, again. have a good evening. Good night. Thank you, everyone.